When people look at modern Middle Eastern history, they tend to begin at the end of the First World War and draw every subsequent problem to the Sykes-Picot Agreement. This was when the British and French divided up the Middle East between themselves, and this, along with their other colonies, placed most of the Islamic world under European rule. However, like with most other simplistic explanations, it often ignores all of the history of the region and its peoples. After all, the huge Muslim empires, which once owned everything from the gates of Vienna to the borders of China, were completely divided by numerous religious sects and ethnicities. For instance, various Persian dynasties were based on different ethnic groups, like the Afsharids, while over in Afghanistan, the Pashtuns created the Durrani Empire, or in many Middle Eastern countries, they'd be ruled over by a mix of foreign slave soldiers or even converts. Like many of the rulers of North Africa were Mamluks from Georgia, or even the governors of Algiers and the likes were more often than not converts from Europe, such as Mezo Morto Hussein Pasha, who was from Mallorca. And more often than not, power would be fought over between these foreigners, while the larger Arab populations were ignored. But even within the Arab populations, they too can be divided into various groups, like the sedentary groups in the cities and the Bedouin, who for simplicity's sake, we'll just call nomadic Arabs. Plus there are the tribes, which are almost too innumerable to count. Then, if you were to zoom into some areas, you could find even more subdivisions, like in Iraq, where there's the Marsh Arabs. They live, as the name suggests, in the Mesopotamian marshes, and their origin is pretty much a complete mystery. Some claim they came from India, while others say they were pre-Islamic Arabs, known as the Nabataeans. Whatever the case may be, there used to be up to 8 million of them in Iraq in the middle of the 20th century, but have suffered from a great deal of persecution. To further complicate matters, to even refer to Arabs as an ethnic group is somewhat controversial. It's probably best to describe them as more of a cultural group, a loose collection of people who all share a similar language. For instance, there are Arab groups living in southern Iran known as the Huwala. They were Arabs who migrated to Persia in the 15th century and formed a sizable chunk of the population, but they began to marry the locals and created a unique group of Iranian Arabs. Many other groups were Arabized, with maybe no real genealogical link to the Arabian Peninsula. Many people in what we would call Arabic countries recognized this problem. For instance, in the early 20th century in Egypt, there were two movements. One in which saw people identify themselves as Arabs, but there was another, known as Pharaonism. Here they argued that they were unique in the Middle East, with stronger ties to their ancient past rather than anything Arabic. Similar movements took place across the region, like in Lebanon, where some wanted to promote Phoenicianism. Or in later history, Saddam Hussein often portrayed himself as a Babylonian ruler, not necessarily an Arab. But all of these types of nationalism came about very recently, and in many regards it's easy to see why. Many of the Arabian people were ruled over by foreigners, like Turkish, Georgian and even Albanian. Many Arabs could be black-skinned, while others were white. Many speak different types of Arabic, and possibly more important than anything, they're more likely to identify with their tribe. Many of the most influential tribes, at least in early times, had some sort of connection to the Prophet's family, and tradition dictates you could divide them into groups, which they call skulls. But each of these has various offshoots, each living in different regions, and sometimes they settled down, while other times they remained nomadic. Just as one example, there's the Bani Utba, a tribal confederation in the early modern period. Their ancestors were expelled from Iraq by the Ottomans because they kept on attacking caravans. They moved to Kuwait and some continued on to Najd and then Qatar. Various tribes united again to help fight on both sides of conflicts between the Persians and Oman. Then in the late 18th century, they took over Bahrain for themselves, and the ruling family of Bahrain comes from this tribe. So too in fact does the House of Sabah, the ruling family in Kuwait. This complicated history is true for most of the ruling families and the tribes. Like in 1833, 800 members of the Bani Yas tribe conquered Dubai, and their tribe became the ruling house of Maktoum. Or take the example of Shamar. They migrated from Yemen to Jebel Shamar, only in the 17th century. There they formed an alliance of sorts with the Ottomans. But some migrated even further as far north as Mosul, 
often displacing the other tribes that lived within Iraq, and recently, they've even formed their own militia to protect their tribe against ISIS. So the Ottoman Empire had to deal with all sorts of tribal conflicts, like in 1757, when the Bani Sakur tribe killed 20,000 pilgrims on their way back from Mecca. So the Ottomans would often play tribe against tribe, maintaining some sort of disorder along their borders. For instance, they sometimes sided with the Al Muntafiq against the Shamar. This tribe, the Al Muntafiq on the east of Arabia, was a mix of Sunni and Shia, but their tribal identity was far greater than their religious differences. Another important tribe was the Banu Hashim, who, ever since the Ottoman conquest of the Mamluks, were granted control over Mecca. They therefore became the Sharifs of the city, and later would be tapped to be the unifiers of Arabia and created the Hashemite dynasty. But they were not even the most powerful tribe in Arabia. The House of Saud, for instance, was part of the larger Banu Hanifa tribe, and they would launch unification campaigns following the incredibly strict Wahhabi sect. They made alliances with the Bani Yas in the UAE, and both were enemies of other tribes and nations, like the Omani and the Shamar in the north, or even the Al Muntafiq in the east. So, to assume had Britain and France granted all of Arabia to the Hashemites, then peace would reign? Well, that would only make sense if you completely ignore the huge tribal differences in Arabia. And that's just the Arab tribes. On top of that, you had tribes of Armenians, Kurdish, and even Turkic tribes in Anatolia. While over in Persia, Turkic tribes like the Qajars would take power and form their own ruling dynasty. Or before them, there was the Zan dynasty, which was created by a lackey speaking Kurdish tribe. At various times in Arabian history, you can pluck out a nation created by a tribe, and within a hundred years or so, they'd be ousted by a tribe that had migrated from completely different areas. Like before the Bani Utbah came into the Gulf region, that area was controlled by the Bani Khalid Emirate for around 130 years, from 1669 to 1799. This meant for the longest time, the idea of a nation state could not have been cultivated. Even the idea of an Arab nation was a pretty recent creation. Some put the beginning of Arab nationalism to Napoleon's invasion of Egypt and the rise of Muhammad Ali Pasha, but he was an Albanian and never really pushed for the idea of Arab unity. Most of the Arab nationalist groups, like the Young Arab Society, were formed only a couple years before World War I. This society, which met in Paris, was made up of intellectuals from cities, and in their first two years of operation, they only had five members. Then, at the Arab Congress, which only happened in 1913 in Paris, these intellectuals would meet the Arab League Society and their founder, Rashid Ridda. He favoured forming a caliphate, not some sort of liberal Arabic state. And to complicate matters even further, many Arabs within the Ottoman parliament actually opposed the Ottoman constitution. But of course, many of the tribes didn't care about this congress in Paris and spent most of their time fighting one another, like the al Fadan and the Rawala, who were at war with one another in the late 19th century. In the final years of the Ottoman Empire, reformers tried to finally exploit the resources of the region and offered permanent control over land if the tribal leaders would settle down. Many in the Al Muntafiq tribe took up the offer and became incredibly rich landlords, renting out their new land for exploitation. So, a great deal of Ottoman territory was still left inhabited by nomads. Modern day Jordan, for instance, was largely a Bedouin area, and their capital city of Amman was only really resettled after centuries of abandonment in 1878. And it wasn't Arabs that settled there, it was Circassians. These came from the Caucasus region and had largely escaped Russian genocide. Historian Salim Dengil describes this late Ottoman policy as borrowed colonialism, trying to civilize the people through missionaries and the creation of modern military units, like the Hamidai Light Cavalry Regiments. These were made up solely of Kurdish tribesmen, but they were only created in the 1890s. Their creation, however, caused further problems, as one of their roles was to collect taxes, and they would often act brutally when dealing with other tribes and ethnicities. These tribal divisions in the Middle East are still very important today. Like in the civil war in Yemen, you can really break down the conflict between different tribes. Or in Iraq, there was the al bu Nasir tribe from Tikrit. This small tribe of 35,000 or so historically were Bedouin shepherds, 
but this was the tribe that Saddam Hussein came from. Once he took power, most of the high-ranking people in the government came from this tribe, including Chemical Ali and most leaders of the Republican Guard. So, in short, the British and the French could well have divided the Middle East along tribal lines, but as I mentioned before, most of these tribes were nomadic and moved from place to place. But then again, you could try to divide up the Islamic world through religion. One of the most clear divisions is that between Sunni and Shia. To grossly oversimplify this division, they emerged after the death of the Prophet. Sunnis wanted Abu Bakr to rule after Muhammad, while the Shia supported Ali, the Prophet's cousin. But, often ignored, there's actually a third major sect, known as the Abadis. They are actually the successors of an older sect known as the Qajarites. The Qajarites could be described as a group of early extremists. That supported Ali just like the Shia did. However, they refused to accept any peace made and the rise of the Umayyad Caliphate. They also believed that anybody who deviated from the ideal norms of behavior could no longer be called Muslims and were worthy of death. Well, the Abadis were a more moderate group that sort of branched out from the Qajarites. They still refused to accept the peace, but none of their extreme rules. Ibn Abad led the moderates from Basra, but his elected successors very quickly created their first state in Yemen. They even, in the 700s, took control of Mecca and Medina for a little while. Missionaries spread their message to Algeria, where they created the Rustamid dynasty, and they could also be found in Sindh, Zanzibar, and even Sicily. But they largely formed a base in Oman after creating an imamate there in the 8th century. An imamate, by the way, is just a theological state controlled by an imam or a leader of a certain sect. As for the other titles that will keep popping up, a sultan is the highest civil office and therefore a largely secular role, more like a European king. And a caliph is the highest of both the religious and secular spheres and seen to be sort of a successor of Muhammad or leader of the entire Islamic world. There are of course a bunch of other titles in the Islamic world, like an emir. This was originally just a title in the army, but over time it referred to the leader of a country that declared their allegiance to a larger caliph. So the emir of Bani Khalid would recognize the caliph in the Ottoman Empire, so we could sort of compare it to a principality. While today there's also many sheikhs, but this is uniquely Arabian and is used to refer to a tribal elder. But over time this title began to be bestowed upon leaders of various states in the Gulf region. But going back to the Abadis, I bring them up first as a simple way to show just how quickly a religious sect could spread in the Islamic world. This wasn't like in Christian Europe, where you could almost draw dividing lines between Catholic and Protestant on the map. In the Islamic world, a sect may begin somewhere like Iraq, become the official religion of a state in Yemen, then a century later, pop up in Zanzibar in Spain, before finding a new home in North Africa. This will be true for most of the Shia sects as well. The early Shias continued to fight for Ali's family, believing that the spiritual leaders could only come from Muhammad's family. These leaders, the Imams, formed a somewhat unbroken line for a while. However, more disputes over succession emerged and therefore more sects were created. Like in the 8th century, when Imam Jafar al-Sadiq died. One group formed the Ismaili sect, believing that the rightful successor was Ismail. This was for many centuries the largest Shia sect and it was even the official religion of the Fatimids in Egypt. This dynasty was even named after Muhammad's daughter Fatima, who they claimed to be descended from. But first, I'd like to thank Enlisted for sponsoring this video. And for all of you history fans out there, this is the game for you. Enlisted is a multiplayer shooter set in World War II, which truly focuses on historical authenticity. So expect to see realistic uniforms, equipment and vehicles, accurate enough to please all of you history buffs out there. And you can take your troops and fight in some of the most epic campaigns of World War II, like the Battle for Moscow or the Invasion of Normandy. There will also be many more campaigns added in the future. So expect huge battles filled with dozens of soldiers and vehicles in authentic landscapes. Plus for that further dose of realism, you can begin to construct defences like sandbag fortifications, anti-air guns and more. And all of these and a lot more can be destroyed in this realistic world. So there's no more hiding behind wooden fences from tank fire as they will just be blasted out of existence. Otherwise in the heat of battle, you can take control of your own fighters in squad mode. 
Here you can equip your men, give them orders, and take control of individuals, ready to fight off the enemy. All of you can take part in these battles, as it's available on PC, Xbox Series X or S, Xbox One, PS4 or PS5. But there is no purchase necessary. All you need to do is follow my link to download and start playing for free. And for those who do follow my link you can get 3 days of premium time, several orders for troops and even some free weapons. So go to my link in the description and get enlisted today. But for now, let's get back to the video. The Ishmaelis however had even more divisions. Like in the 11th century, there was a power struggle and two new sects emerged. Nazari and Mustali. The Nazari Ishmaeli followers you may have heard of before. As once the Fatimids fell, they, from their mountain castles, formed the Order of Assassins. They also believe that there is an unbroken line of Imams right up until today. However, their Imam currently lives in Portugal, and after being persecuted by the Mongols, Seljuks and the likes, they found a new base in Tajikistan. There, around Korog, is the only real majority Ismaili area. While back in Cairo, when the Ismailis ruled, there was another sect that emerged, known as the Druze. Their history goes back to a sultan known as Al-Hakim, who began to spread the message that he was a prophet of sorts. One man named Al-Darazi even claimed that Al-Hakim was a god. But this was declared a heresy, yet it's believed that's where the Druze got their name from, Darazi. They however refer to themselves as Unitarians, as they believe in a mix of different religions. For instance, St. George is an important figure in their religion, and although it's an Abrahamic religion, they believe in reincarnation, and many are said to be reborn in China if they achieve a certain level of purification. But after their initial proselytizing missions, they accepted no other converts into the religion, and only reincarnated Druze will be Druze. As for Al-Hakim, he mysteriously disappeared, possibly assassinated while out in the desert. But the Druze believe that he went into occultation, which just means he removed himself from the world of humans, but will reappear when the end of time comes. Today, however, the Druze have found a new home in the Levant, especially around Lebanon, after they were chased out of Egypt. But going back to this idea of a leader entering occultation, this idea is shared by many Shia Muslims. Like the most popular branch of Shia Islam, the Twelvers. They believe that the title of Imam was passed from Ali to his son Hussein, and on and on down to Al Askari. He, however, was believed to have been killed by the Abbasids. But there's a belief that he had a son, Muhammad al Mahdi. This son was kept hidden to prevent him from being killed, thus making him the twelfth Imam. His birth is said to somewhat mirror the life of Jesus and Moses, inasmuch as he was saved as a child. And, almost like Jesus, he is set to return to the world shortly before the Day of Judgment. In fact, some believe he will be joined by Jesus to restore the world to the true version of Islam. This sect of Islam had very few followers for most of its history. That was until Ishmael and his Safavids conquered Persia in the early 1500s. But Ishmael and most of Persia had in fact been Sunni for centuries. The Safavids were actually an order of Sunni Sufis, but over time, they began to form an alliance with the Kizil Bash, a group of Shia Turkic people. With their help, he took over their country and agreed to convert to their sect of Shia Islam. It should be said though that there are a few reasons as to why he converted. For starters, by converting to Shia Islam, he could present himself as both a political and a religious leader. Others argue he just wanted to create a unique identity for the Persians to counter the Ottomans, and this would create a further sense of unity in a nation made up of various ethnicities. So the sect became the mandatory religion of Persia. People were forcibly converted, Sunni mosques were destroyed, and remaining Sunnis were killed. But this still isn't the oldest Shia branch. That was created in the 8th century when Zaid ibn Ali, the grandson of Ali, led a revolt against the Umayyads. This failed but those that supported him formed the Zaidiya sect. This sect rejects many Shia ideas, like the idea of a hidden imam, and it's more open to interpretation. So sometimes it's even referred to as the fifth school of Sunni, but I'll get onto those other four schools in a bit. In the 9th century, an imam travelled into Yemen, and there they set up a base. The old kings of Yemen followed the Zaidi sect, and today the Houthis of Yemen, currently fighting against the Sunnis, follow this branch of Shia Islam. 
There's also another branch of Shia Islam that's a little hard to describe, but you may have heard of them. They're known as the Alawites. This, despite being the minority religion of Syria, is the sect of the Assad family. Their history, however, is a little mysterious. Some argue it was created by Ibn Nusayr, who was a disciple of the 10th and the 11th Shia Imams. He then declared himself to be the Bab, or the Gateway of Truth. So, until the French arrived, they were called the Nusayrids. But others say that they were pagans who adopted Christianity and only later Islam. However, they kept many of their old beliefs. Like they believe that God has revealed himself numerous times to humanity in the form of a trinity. Some of these trinities include the likes of Plato and Socrates. But the final trinity included Ali, Muhammad, and the Persian disciple of Muhammad, Salman al-Farisi. They also believe in transmigration. This is when souls of wicked people may pass onto the bodies of dogs and pigs. And they continue to celebrate old Christian holidays like Christmas and even ancient Mesopotamian and Zoroastrian traditions. So throughout all of their history, they've been considered heretics. Now, you may notice that quite a few branches believe that the end of the world is coming and there will be a savior. This has real implications in history and it's important to keep in mind. For instance, in the 9th century, the Ismaili Karmatians seized Bahrain. They believed that the end of the world was inevitable and went on a rampage across Arabia. They sacked Baghdad and they even sacked Mecca in 930. They even stole the black stone from the Kaaba and filled the holy Zamzam well with the corpses of murdered pilgrims. They began following a Persian named Al-Ishfahani, who they believed was God incarnate. In some reports, he almost seems to be bringing them back to Zoroastrians, but in others, he is referred to as the Mahdi. This belief in the Mahdi changes somewhat between the sects. But in short, the story says that the world will be filled with anarchy and chaos, and the Dajjal would appear. This is a one-eyed giant who will claim to be the savior, but he will just bring about chaos with an army of the children of prostitutes and Jewish people. But then the Mahdi would appear, leading an army bearing black banners. Jesus will then appear in Damascus and personally kill the Dajjal. Both Jesus and the Mahdi would then die, evil would reappear, but then the world would end. This belief that the world would end soon or experience a great change is called millenarianism. And again, when looking at the history of Islam, it's vital to keep in mind. Numerous people have claimed to be the Mahdi throughout history, most notably in Sudan in the 19th century, starting the Mahdist Wars with Britain. But also in the 1400s, Muhammad Janpuri claimed it in India. He even started his own sect, known as the Mahdavi. They were forced out of the region by the British, but today, they actually have a center over in Chicago. There's even a Mahdist sect in Baluchistan in Pakistan, known as Zikri. They believe that a Mahdist figure known as Nur Pak was around at the time of Adam and will return to bring back the true version of Islam. Nur Pak was allegedly born in the 16th century and they claim that it was not Jang Puri, although some others claim that they were in fact the same people. More recently, in 1979, followers of one Mahdi seized the Grand Mosque of Mecca. And more recently still, the Iraqi government has revealed that they had hundreds of Mahdi claimants in their prisons. But moving on to Sunni Islam, they don't really have sects as such, but rather schools of thought. Their goal is to try to live as close to the Prophet as possible, but this is easier said than done. There's obviously the Quran as guidance, but there's also historic traditions and hadiths, statements and reports made on the Prophet, some of which can be trusted, some of which cannot. Plus, they need to adapt all of these teachings to new problems that would not be mentioned in the Quran. The Hanafi school was the first to try to deal with all of these problems. This emerged in Iraq, and it favors a more rational approach to texts, looking at the reasons behind certain passages and debating them. This, they hoped, would lead them to the correct outcome, rather than just following a single, possibly unreliable, hadith. But then came the Maliki school, and that emerged in Medina. This draws more on the Sunnah, the traditions and practices of the Prophet, or, more likely, the people of Medina. The Shafi school came next, trying to bridge the gaps between the different schools. All of the Hadiths were collected and categorized by reliability. To try and build up their school of thought, they disregarded the weak Hadiths and only focused on the reliable ones. 
finally came the Hanabali. They are taught that the Quran is the chief source of information and there is far less room for interpretation. This school of thought is predominant in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and they consider themselves to be the purer version of Islam. But there's no real fight between these different groups, they just have different interpretations on the rules. For instance, when it comes to praying, they may hold their hands in different places, or they'll have different rules when it comes to seafood. Like the Hanbal and Shafi said all seafood is okay, the Malik says everything except eel is okay, while Hanafi said only fish is halal. But you may have heard of other versions of Sunni Islam, known as the Salafists or the Wahhabis. These are often used interchangeably, but there is a difference. Salafists try to recreate the original version of Islam, or in other words, they reject the four schools which came after the Prophet and the early Caliphs. But this is a pretty vague idea, and can apply to a great number of Muslims. Anybody who may want to live like the Prophet could be described as a Salafist. The Wahhabis are just a branch of the Salafists, but they are not the only one. Wahhabism was created in the 18th century by a preacher named Al-Wahhab, who made a pact with the House of Saud. The Saud family would take over the ruling of a new state, the Saudi state, while he would look after the religious ideology. But he actually studied the writings of Ibn Taymiyyah, a medieval scholar who argued against many folk practices that emerged in Islam, like the worship of tomb shrines and saint veneration. He also believed that through takfir, you could declare other Muslims to be non-believers if they didn't follow the religion correctly, and then you could declare jihad on them. Now, he wrote during the time of the Mongol invasions, so you can draw some connections between his writings and the dawn of Salafism in later history. Al-Wahhab and many other thinkers during the Islamic revival were writing when the Islamic empires were on the decline and suffering from invasions, this time though from the Europeans. For instance, Shah Wali Ula Delawi was a contemporary of Al-Wahhab, but he was writing over in India. He would actually go on to spread a similar Salafist belief, but he came from the Hanafi school. His school of thought would go on to form the Deobandi movement. Their focus, again, was on returning to the old ways, to bring about salvation, but it was also heavily linked to the anti-colonial movement. Over time, though, it became more popular in independent Pakistan, and from there it spread over the border into Afghanistan, where it became the dominant belief of the Taliban. However, the Saudi Wahhabis do spread their ideology in Diobandi Madras, so it's very complicated and often overlaps. There is something though that both of these ideas and much of Shia Islam reject though, and that's Sufism. This is not a sect of Islam, but rather a different way of practicing it. There are in fact both Sunni and Shia Sufis. Some you may know already, like the whirling dervish of Turkey and Sudan, who are just a specific version of Sufism. Others describe Sufis as being a more mystic version of Islam, or maybe a more introspective version, where people look for God within. To do this, Sufis can do various things like dance in a group, or even sort of a version of chanting meditation. For simplicity's sake, and only for simplicity's sake, you can compare it to the medieval Christian monks chanting in their monasteries, or like many of the Buddhist practices. Yet again though, they are not a sect of Islam, they just believe in worshipping Islam differently. One of their groups that is quite hard to pin down are the Alevis. They are a collection of Shia Muslims, primarily in Turkey, that follow the teachings of a mystic named Haji Bektashveli. Many claim that their religion comes from pre-Islamic roots. After all, they were originally Turkic migrants, and they may have brought many of their shamanistic practices from Central Asia. So they have actually been persecuted for most of their history but they are just one of the many different types of Sufis you could find. So, if we were to divide the Middle East according to the Islamic faith, this is what it would look like. But then again, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were a whole host of other religions. Christianity obviously still has a major following in the Middle East today, but before World War I, this was far larger. Huge chunks of Western Anatolia were made up of ethnic Greek Christians, while the East was filled with Armenian Christians. Now I should interject and say with any of these, the percentage of people who were Christian, Sunni, Shia, Greek, Armenian, Turkic, etc. is sometimes speculative. It is also very often contested and, more likely than not, incredibly complicated. 
Plus, through genocides, repressions, migrations and the likes, the numbers vary widely over time. Just sticking with the Armenians, they made up probably 40% of the Van Vilayet, 30% of Bitlis, and 20% of Izmit on the other side of Anatolia. But this was at the outbreak of World War I, already after repressive campaigns had been launched. Or if you take Jerusalem, every report in the 19th century provided radically different population records. Most agree that the city had between 15 and 20,000 people, but in 1856, an Austrian travel writer said 9,000 were Muslim, 3,000 were Christian, and 6,000 were Jews. In the 1860s, though, a British travel writer reported 8,000 Jews, 4,000 Muslims, and 4,000 Christians. The Karl Baedeker Travel Guide in 1871 then reported 13,000 Muslims, 4,000 Jews, and 7,000 Christians, while the British consul said there were 10,000 Jews, 5,000 Muslims, and 5,500 Christians. You can keep on replicating this across the region, so take this map with a huge grain of salt. As for other Christians, in Syria and Iraq, there is a complicated web of churches which fall under the larger branch of Syrian Christianity. This is one of the oldest branches of Christianity and at one point was equal to the Greek and Latin churches. So the history of this church is long and, as you'd expect, complicated. They first became independent in the 5th century when a man named Nestorius challenged the church doctrine over the nature of Jesus. His followers in the East formed the Eastern Church or the Nestorian Church, which spread quickly, even as far away as China, India and Mongolia. But slowly their importance waned until, in the Middle East, their only real followers were the Assyrians. These were the descendants of ancient Assyrians and, although they were surrounded by Muslims, maintained their Christian faith. This is largely around cities like Aleppo, Mosul and Baghdad and up in the Kurdish mountains. From the Crusades up until the 1700s, many Syriacs began to form closer relations with Rome and favoured joining back with them, so they formed the Syriac Catholic Church, while those who refused to join continued on with the Syriac Orthodox Church. But over in nearby Lebanon, about one third of their population is Christian, however most of them are Maronites. This branch of Christianity was created by a hermit named Maron. They found a new home isolated around Mount Lebanon, where, after the Arab invasions, they became independent from the Church of Antioch. The church in Antioch did remain though, and it became a bit of a blend of different ideas. Their liturgy had clearly been influenced by the Byzantine Church, however they also kept communication with Rome. And in the 1700s, some joined the Catholic Church, forming the Greek Melkite Catholic Church. They now can be found across the Middle East, but at the turn of the 20th century, many could be found in Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon. Now, I should say the church in Antioch was one of the five ancient churches of Christianity. There was Constantinople, Rome, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria. But as for Alexandria, they governed over the Coptic Christians of Egypt. Coptic actually just means Egyptian, and their branch of Christianity broke away in the 400s, once again arguing over the nature of Jesus. Under Byzantine rule, they were actually persecuted quite a bit, so many actually welcomed the Islamic invasion of Egypt. So, there are some of the Christian groups in the Middle East. However, let's move on to the Jewish people. They obviously had a community in the Middle East since ancient times. Besides Jerusalem, Babylon had actually been a center of Jewish learning for thousands of years. In fact, even when Muhammad took over Medina, there was a Jewish community there. Many Jews did flee to Europe once the Romans destroyed the Temple of Jerusalem, but many did stay in the Middle East. Then, over time, more Jewish groups began to reappear in the Middle East, like the Shephardic, who fled Christian Spain at the end of the Reconquista. Then, in the 1700s, the first Ashkenazi families moved from Lithuania to Jerusalem. Along with the Holy Land and Babylon, they also had large populations in Istanbul, Alexandria, Tunis, Izmir, and even the Caucasus, where, under Russian rule, they were called the Mountain Jews. But if you were to actually begin to divide places on religious grounds, including sects, well, in the early 20th century, Baghdad would have been a Jewish city. They accounted for 88,000 out of 200,000 people, while Christians made up 12,000. There were obviously more Muslims at over 100,000, but they were split between Sunni and Shia. And although today the city is majority Shia, 
this wasn't the case a hundred years ago, as it was largely a Sunni city. Otherwise, the Jewish people in the Middle East even had their own versions of millenarianism. Sabati Zevi in the 1600s claimed to be the Jewish Messiah and, by all reports, seems to have had a following across Europe. Even in England, a German diplomat wrote, all the world here is talking of a rumor of the return of the Israelites to their own country. But to continue adding to this extensive list is also the Mandaeans, who believe that John the Baptist was in fact the final prophet. This group is possibly the last and only remaining followers of Gnosticism. This ethno-religious group used to have 70,000 or so followers in Iraq until very recently. Otherwise, in the middle of the 19th century, there was a new prophet known as the Bab. He went around Persia declaring that all prophets were just different manifestations of God. He wasn't even the first Persian to do this, as centuries earlier, a prophet named Mani created the incredibly influential religion known as Manichaeism. This, at one point, had followers in the Roman Empire and China. One of the Bab's followers, known as Baha'u'llah, tried to assassinate the Shah, so the religion was persecuted. However, after years underground, it re-emerged as the Baha'i faith. Zoroastrianism as well, the religion of ancient Persia, had survived. Many fled to India where they are called Parsis, but even in the Middle East, there are still tens of thousands of them. They still even had fire temples in operation, especially in Azerbaijan, until very recently. Sticking in Persia, you also have the Asani, who claim that they were around long before all other religions, although the Muslims say that theirs is just a heresy of Islam. They believe in one God who reappears on earth, and the most recent incarnation was a Kurd named Sultan Sahak, who lived in the Middle Ages. But trying to sort out what is fact on this religion is quite difficult. In some ways, their views of an inner and outer world are somewhat similar to that of the Sufis, but that is very, very simplistic. As for other religions over in Israel, there are the Samaritans, who I'm sure you've heard of. In many ways, they are quite similar to the Jews, as they lived in Canaan in ancient times, they follow some of the books in the Torah, and even call themselves the children of Israel. However, they believe that Mount Gerizim, not Mount Zion, is the home of God. The Jews actually hated this group for a very long time. For instance, they destroyed their temple on Mount Gerizim, and then there's the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. In Iraq, there's also the Yazidi in the north. They believe that they were created separately to the rest of humanity by a supreme creator God. But he sent seven divine beings to govern over the universe. The most important is a peacock angel. But many outside of their religion refer to this belief in fallen angels as a form of devil worship. The Yazidi seem to have emerged some time around the 12th century from a branch of Sufism, but over time they merged together some of their older beliefs with Islam to create their own ideas. Again, it's very hard to pin down exact beliefs when describing these small, often persecuted groups. But if we were to divide the Middle East according to religion, it would look something like this. But then of course, to make it even more complicated, there's ethnicity. To try and briefly sum this up, we could divide people along language lines, Semitic. Semitic like the Arabs, Iranic like the Persians and Kurds, the Turkic people, the Caucasic like the Circassian and Georgian, and smaller groups like the Greek, and even speakers of Cushitic languages like the Beja people of Egypt. I've already mentioned the Arabs, so let's start with the Turkic people. They came from the east from the borders of China, sometimes as invaders, sometimes as refugees. They can obviously be found in Anatolia, but also in Iran, with groups like the Kashkai in the south and the Aziri in the north. But there's even smaller groups like the Afshars, who are nomadic, but created the short-lived Afshara dynasty in Persia. This was ruled over by Nadia Shah, who attacked the Mughals and sacked Delhi. In Iraq, the Turkic people also made up a sizable chunk of cities like Kurkut, and Turkey, for a long time, had some sort of claim to this territory. While pushing out further east, the north of Afghanistan is made up of groups like the Turkmens and Uzbeks, both of which are Turkic people. In fact, in the 19th century, right up until today, there has been a movement to unite all of the Turkic people together into one nation. However, in modern-day Turkey, there's still a bit of a distinction between the Turks and the Turkmens that came later. These Turkic people lived side by side in many places with the Iranic people, like the Persians and the Kurds. The Persians clearly are those descended from the old empire, but the Kurds have a completely mysterious origin. 
Some claim they are descendants of the old empire of Medes. Others say that they are a mix of various groups, while others say they are just nomads. The Kurds we can break down into different tribes, and even among the Persians, there are still smaller groups, like the Lurs people in the south, the Mazanis, and the Galaks in the north. The Baluch people are also an Iranian group, and they again have a mysterious origin. But it seems that they traveled from the west, potentially as far away as Syria, through Persia, to find their new home on the Pakistani-Iranian borders. To the north of them, there are the Pashtuns. They live in an area which was once home to the Bactrians, Sogdians, and even the Greeks for a little while. These various Pashtun tribes were united by Ahmad Shah Durrani, who created his own empire. This empire even conquered lands from the Persians after the fall of Nadir Shah. Further north still, there's the Hazaras. They have remained Shia in a largely Sunni Afghanistan. So, as you'd expect, they remain one of the most persecuted groups in the country. Like other groups, their origin is disputed, so, more than likely, they're a mix of different ethnicities. As for the rest of Afghanistan, it's made up of different groups like the Tajiks. Then, even within most of the largely Arabic countries, there's still huge differences between an Arab in Sudan and an Arab in Iraq, for instance. But you can still find other ethnicities in these countries. The Berbers, who were in North Africa long before the Arabs, still live in places like Morocco. And one of their offshoots, the Touaregs, seek independence from Algeria and Libya. The Tubal people also inhabit southern Libya as well. In southern Egypt, there's the Nubians, who continue to suffer from some pretty overt racism today. Like TV presenter Tamia Amin suggested on TV that the Nubians should raise their children to become servants. And this view of the Nubians as somehow lesser Egyptians has been shared by many throughout history. Nearby are the Beja people, who also live in Sudan. They are largely nomadic, and their Cushitic language makes them closer to the Somalis than the Arabs. But just sticking on Egypt for a moment, as they provide a good example for something common in Muslim countries, they were rarely ruled by the locals. Egypt never really had an Egyptian ruler for over 2,000 years. This would also be sort of true in Persia as well, with the Turkic Qajar dynasty, Kurdish Zan dynasty, and more. But in Egypt, their rulers were Persian, Macedonian, Roman, Byzantine, and Arab. Even the Ayyubid dynasty, which Saladin ruled over, was Kurdish. The Mamluks came in next, and they were a military caste of many Georgians and Circassians. They had often been taken as slaves by Islamic rulers, forced to convert, and then they formed the basis of the militaries and even government. They were similar to the Janissaries, who are possibly the most famous of these foreign slave soldiers, but really, these slave soldiers have been present throughout Islamic history. After the Mamluks came the Turkic Ottomans, and after them, Muhammad Ali Pasha, the Albanian, and only in the 20th century with the rise of Nasser, did an Egyptian rule Egypt. The Albanians that Muhammad Ali Pasha came from, by the way, didn't belong to the Janissaries. They were Bashi Bazouk, a group of irregular troops which were quite notoriously cruel, especially in putting down rebellions like in Bulgaria. They were often Albanian, but could also be black Africans. Egypt, like most of the Muslim world, had a booming trade in African slaves, right the way up into the 20th century, and in some places still continues today. In some places like Saudi Arabia, Afro-Arabs make up 10% of the population. And important leaders like Saad al-Salim al-Sabah, who ruled Kuwait in 2006, was the son of an enslaved Ethiopian. In the Ottoman Empire, there are reports of African quarters in cities like Izmir. However, many of them were castrated. So, the population of Afro-Turks today is just a few thousand. Moving across into the Levant and Iraq, there were various ethno-religious groups like the Yazidi and the Druze. But, like with elsewhere, they were joined by a number of Jews migrating from Europe long before the Zionist movement even kicked off. The Circassians also moved into the region as well in the 19th century. And, as I mentioned before, they resettled in the city of Amman. They, however, had long been slaves across the Middle East, and formed the basis of many of the slave armies. They were also joined by Crimean Tatars that were fleeing the Russian Empire, and today there's about 5 million of them in Turkey. They settled in the center of Anatolia, while to the north, that was inhabited by a huge mix of people. The Greeks had remained there since ancient times, while in the countryside around them, are the Caucasian Laz people. The Armenians, also prior to the genocide, formed the majority in half of eastern Anatolia. 
and you can zoom into pretty much any region or city and find other groups. Like in Istanbul, there were Muslims, Greeks, Armenians, a few thousand Bulgarians, tens of thousands of Jews, and even a couple thousand Latins. These were the descendants of Italians that lived in the city since the days of the Byzantine Empire, and still today, they have their own churches. So if you put the ethnicities together with the tribes and religions, you can see it's hard to draw an obvious border. Now you may ask with all of these divisions, why not just keep to the old borders? However, problems were brewing within nearly every province for centuries, long before the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Trying to pick a date to start the history of the modern Middle East is not particularly easy. You could begin the timeline at the end of World War I and the dawn of the new borders, or you could go all the way back to the siege of Vienna when the Ottomans entered their period of stagnation. However, I believe the end of the 18th century is probably the best starting point, as this was a pivotal time for nearly every country. In Arabia, the Wahhabis and the Saudis signed a pact and began to spread their new ideology. In Egypt, Napoleon invaded and Muhammad Ali came to power and his dynasty tried to create an empire of their own. In Persia, numerous dynasties collapsed until finally the Qajar dynasty rose. And in India, the Mughal Empire was reduced to a rum state. In Afghanistan, the Durrani Empire rose. In short, it was a crucial period in the Islamic world. Yet, it's worth doing a quick scan over the other powers in the 1700s, starting with the major Islamic powers, the Ottomans, Persia, and the Mughals. These, the gunpowder empires, were once dominant, but by the 18th century, they were on the decline. Now, many point to roughly the same causes for the fall of these empires, like the lack of development, particularly as opposed to the Europeans. Or some blame European colonialism, whether it be the Russians in the Caucasus or Britain in India. Others blame that they became decadent, like the Ottoman slave soldiers, the Janissaries, who gave up on their military ways and adopted a more peaceful bureaucratic life with their families. However, once you start picking at any of these threads, you'll find out that the story is not so simple. Going a little bit further back to the 1600s, this period was pretty disastrous for both the Europeans and the Ottomans. Historians call this period in Europe the General Crisis, as it was filled with religious wars, plague pandemics, and environmental problems like the Little Ice Age. But this was also true for many of the Islamic empires. The Ottomans in the 1620s had a plague epidemic and the Great Winter of 1621. This was in fact so bad that the Bosphorus froze and it caused a famine. Yet through it all, the empires did adapt, and in the case of the Ottomans, survived for another 200 years. For instance, late in the century, they modernized their navy to such an extent that even English diplomats were impressed and sought to emulate them. While on the other side of Asia, the Mughals were incredibly well armed, even with rocket artillery. So they were developing. But there were some aspects of the modern world that some empires rejected for a while. For instance, the printing press. In the Ottoman Empire, Jews, Armenians, and other groups used it, but the Muslims refused to do so until the early 1700s. There are some reasons behind this, like the authority of the Islamic scholars, who would have seen their power as the gatekeepers of knowledge diminish. So, in France at the end of the 18th century, 47% of men were literate, 68% of British men were, and 80% of Prussian men were. Well, they were literate to a degree that they could sign their name. The Ottoman Empire and the other gunpowder empires, on the other hand, probably only had a literate population of 2-3%. to Yet, when compared with the rivals of the Ottoman Empire, the numbers balance out a bit more. Russia, for instance, probably only had 6% of literate men, and Spain not much higher, at around 10%. The other often cited cause of their demise is weak leadership and lavish lifestyles of their rulers, especially after Suleiman the Magnificent. Most sultans were kept inside the palace their entire lives, and were, largely, ill-equipped to govern the state. The reason behind this was because Suleiman's own sons, the ones that had learned how to fight and govern, actually betrayed him. So the next sultan was Selim II, who was known as Selim the Drunkard. Plus beforehand, the sultans would often kill their own siblings to stop any rebellions. But from the late 16th century, they would largely just leave them to live in luxury in the palaces as well. With the sultan's authority diminishing, power was slowly divided up between other institutions. This division of power, however, doesn't necessarily spell disaster. After all, the British king shared power with Parliament, and Japanese emperors surrendered power to the shoguns. And much of Europe was filled with lavish courts, like in France. 
and although the king may have lost his head, the country not only survived, but continued to expand. However, factionalism within the Ottoman court was commonplace. Sometimes the slave Janissary soldiers took a great deal of power, bribing or threatening their way into administrative posts. Or, for around a century from the middle of the 1500s, the wives or mothers of sultans held a great deal of power. Hence, this period was called the Sultanate of the Women. What's interesting here, though, is the vast majority of these women were actually foreigners. They could be Russian, Venetian, Greek, Circassian, or practically from anywhere except Turkey. Also within the court, eunuchs could very often be the kingmakers. These eunuchs were divided between white eunuchs, usually from the Balkans, and black eunuchs from Africa. Some of these played a vital role during the Sultanate of the Women and helped remove some influential women from power. While in the 18th century, Bashir Aga would have the power to depose viziers. More often than not, though, it was these grand viziers that would usually fill the void and act like a sultan. For instance, Mehmet Koprulu ruled in the 17th century. He rooted out corruption and even tried to make the Ottoman Empire an expansionist nation once again. His brother-in-law would rule after him, and he would send troops to Vienna, believing the Reformation had weakened Europe. However, by now, European countries had been catching up with the Islamic world. Plus, beforehand, the Ottomans were able to exploit the differences between European nations, allowing the Bulgarians and Serbians to fight one another before moving in. But now, the Europeans were more inclined to aid one another. So this unity of European nations could very much have started the period of stagnation. And I should also say that Europeans may have brought about the demise of the Islamic empires by sailing around Africa. This meant that the trade that once flowed from China through Persia into the Ottoman Empire now completely bypassed them. This is an often cited cause, but really it affected some more than others. The Central Asian Khanids completely declined, and Persia adapted to this change incredibly slowly. But for the Ottomans, their budget actually grew during this period, from 1 million Akja in 1699 to 1.5 million 50 years later. Plus, the increase in trade in the region actually provided new market for things like coffee, which Ottoman Yemen had a monopoly over. They also still produced a great deal like textiles and leather goods that were sold in Europe. However, to raise further revenues, the Ottomans introduced Malikane. This was a form of tax farming, which I'll get onto later. However, I believe this is one of the chief causes behind their decline. But now in Europe, the Ottomans faced a somewhat united Catholic force of Polish, Austrians, Venetians, and more. To make matters even worse, Russia under Peter the Great would also become a modern expansionist power. Before him, the Russians built forts out of wood, and until quite recently, the Ottomans vassals in Crimea were raiding Moscow for slaves. But now the Russians too were using gunpowder. This again is seemingly the greatest cause of Ottoman stagnation. Before they faced weak disjointed armies, but now they faced equal powers on all sides. So in the end, the Ottomans would lose in Vienna, and the United Europeans would drive them out of Hungary in 1699, and huge chunks of the Balkans later on. However, that's not to say the Ottomans were now forever on the retreat. For instance, they retook Moria from the Venetians, demonstrating they were capable of fighting modern wars, just maybe not on all fronts. Their loss of Hungary, though, also seems to have encouraged them to make some reforms in the 18th century. They finally began printing their own books, they opened up a technical university in the capital, and an artillery school modeled on the Western style. But still, they had to fight the Russians in the north, Persians in the east, the Austrians in the Balkans, and the Venetians at sea. To give some examples of these wars, they'd fight the Russians in 1710, 1735, 1768, and 1787. And they'd also fight Persia in 1730, 1743, and 1775. And this is just in the 18th century alone. Yet, strangely, possibly one of the worst things to affect the Ottoman army at this time was a period of peace on the Western Front from 1740 to 1768. This was a period of peace for the Ottomans, but was a time of conflict for the Europeans as they fought the Seven Years' War. This war brought about huge changes in tactics on the battlefield, and in many cases, a complete societal change. The French would later cut off the head of their king and introduce mobilization to fight off all invading European armies. The Americans would declare their independence, forming a republic, the British, Prussians, and many other nations would begin to feel a sense of nationalism, a unity of character represented by symbols and the likes. The Ottomans, on the other hand, 
continued on much as they did before. There was no great need to completely restructure their army, and the wave of nationalism which would come to the Empire later on would eventually prove to be disastrous. Yet still, I don't believe this is their chief problem, and this brings me possibly to their greatest issue, and this would be true for all of the gunpowder empires. Their nations were just incredibly divided. After such rapid conquests, they left a lot of the existing powers in place. So, authority in regions were split between various groups who often acted autonomously, and power in the capital was only possible by balancing a complicated web of these alliances together. The Ottomans would have to deal with pirates in Algeria, Mamluks in Egypt, Kurdish states in Iraq, the Druze in Lebanon, and a whole host of other leaders. These leaders were also usually foreign, often fought against one another, and constantly struggled for more power against the government in Constantinople. Whether that was through outright independence wars, removing Ottoman governors from their territory, taking over the taxes, or fighting with their neighbours. However, as we look at the history of the region, you will see how complicated this gets. On top of all that, in the early 18th century, Mustafa II sent his soldiers to Georgia, hoping to install a puppet on the throne. His janissaries, however, had not been paid, and they revolted in 1703. This, the Dern incident, saw the Sultan replaced by his brother, Ahmed III, and it demonstrated to all future Sultans that challenging the power of the Janissaries could be a very dangerous game. Ahmed III is probably best known for the Tulip period, a period of relative peace in which there was actually a bit of a Tulip craze. Internationally, he got involved in some conflicts, losing further land to the Austrians and fighting with the Russians. This war began because he gave the King of Sweden sanctuary and was part of the much larger Great Northern War. But their campaign against the Russians, the Pruth River Campaign, was actually successful, proving they were not completely out of the military race yet. But soon the Persians would invade, and he would be removed by the Janissaries. This time, though, it was an Albanian named Petrona Halil that led thousands in revolt and forced Ahmed to surrender his throne over to Mahmud I. He cracked down on the rebels and secured power until the middle of the 1750s. During his reign, he lost some influence around Ukraine to the Russians, but was able to recapture some land, like Belgrade from the Austrians. But this marked the beginning of peace on the Western Front that was to be so disastrous, as he had to deal with a resurgent Persia who invaded the East. Mustafa III, who came after him, also lost further land to the Russians in 1774, including their vassal state, the Crimean Khanate. But attempts were made to reform the army, as French and Prussian advisors were brought into the country to help them. But their loss against the Russians, at least this time, could probably be placed more down to internal divisions which I'll get onto later, as the rulers of Egypt and Palestine broke free and began wars within their own borders. The next war with the Russians and Austrians began in 1787 under Abdul Hamid I. This again was hampered by internal issues as Orthodox Albanians and their Muslim allies began the Soliot War. But by this point, it was beginning to become obvious that the Ottomans were falling behind the other armies. Like at the Battle of Rimnik, 100,000 Ottomans lost to 25,000 men of the combined Russian-Austrian army. Now, some of the changes made to the Russian army beforehand may not sound remarkable, but they seem to have made the difference in this war. Improvement in bayonet training, espionage, supply convoys, and the promotion of generals with new ideas, notably Suvorov, all completely transformed the battlefield. Russian successes were so complete that Suvorov was actually marching on Constantinople, and Catherine the Great had plans on restoring the Byzantine Empire. Thankfully for the Ottomans at least, they were saved thanks to the French Revolution, as European eyes turned towards France instead. The Ottomans were therefore beginning to lag behind, and I'd say changes in just something as simple as infrastructure would prove to be nearly impossible. Bedouin tribesmen still raided travelers, and sometimes even major cities like Aleppo. Governors in the Levant were in a near constant war with one another, and again nearly half of their empire were in open rebellion, or at least acting independently. Guaranteeing safe travel was hard enough, so imagine the complexity of transporting troops and their supplies to fight the Persians or Russians at the other side of their empire. Even raising an army would be hard enough. In France, they could mobilize hundreds of thousands all fighting largely under the same banner. 
While the Ottomans would request troops from often rebellious governors, sometimes these soldiers would come with whatever weapons they had, and sometimes they wouldn't come at all. Much of their army was made up of irregular troops that were poorly trained. Some of these units were based on ethnicities, like Kurdish cavalry units, that spent most of their time collecting taxes and brutalizing other enemy tribes within the empire rather than fighting in foreign wars. And, of course, you had the Janissaries, who could turn against the Sultan at any time. The Ottomans therefore lost a great deal of land in the 18th century, but still this web of internal alliances would probably be more disastrous. This is even more obvious in the Safavid dynasty, the first of these empires to fall. The Safavids were foreigners, Turkic foreigners, and had even forced the population to convert to Shia Islam. The fact that they were foreigners wasn't particularly rare in Persian history, as the Akkoyunlu, who ruled beforehand, were also Turkmen rulers. The Safavids also held on to power through the help of Shia Turkic warriors known as the Kizil Bash, but they too could be divided into various tribes. So a more stable solution for the army was needed. Shah Abbas tried to create a new army, loyal to neither the Turkic people or the Persians, a new unit of soldiers from the Caucasus. These troops from Georgia, Armenia and Circassia would be very prevalent across the Middle East, forming the bulk of the Ottoman Janissaries as well, and even the Mamluks. Plus, it should be said that some soldiers came from further afield, like there seems to have been a small number of Africans in their army. With the help of this new force, the Kizilbash, and the help of some English advisors, the Safavids were able to expand into Uzbek lands and across the Persian Gulf, bringing Shia Islam into the region. But the Safavids were still a tribe, a tribe that needed the support of other ethnic groups to maintain power. Many times that was tested, like in the early 1600s, the Kurds rebelled. Then the Georgians rebelled a couple times when the Shah tried to repopulate their lands with the Kizilbash. The country was also being raided on all fronts by Dagestanis, the Baluch, and many more. And at the same time, they were fighting against the Mughals, the Ottomans, the Russians, and many other nations. Plus, at the same time, they were also saddled with weak rulers. After the rule of great rulers like Ishmael and Abbas, came the likes of Suleiman I, who spent most of his time in his harem and drinking. Nevertheless, many of the Persian, or at least the Turkic nobility, were pretty happy with this setup. Whereas the British had a parliament to continue running the country if they had a mad king like George III, or the Ottomans had their grand vizier, the Persians didn't really have anything like that. Plus, in the past, the rulers constantly moved about their capital, keeping a small but mobile court and appeasing the outer regions. However, now the Shahs were static, trapped in their capital, more specifically the palace, meaning the nobles were essentially free to conduct their own business. Some Shahs did try to assert some authority, like Sultan Hussein. He was extremely religious and began to follow the instructions of the Imams, so he introduced a number of pretty extreme laws. Zoroastrians were forced to convert, and even non-Shia people were forbidden from going outside in the rain, just in case they polluted the Shia. By this point, though, we had entered the 1700s, and the Islamic revival was ongoing. From India to Saudi Arabia, many Salafist thinkers were looking to make Islamic law stricter. The Wahhabis in Arabia, the Diobandi in India, and the Shia scholars of Persia all began to preach a more rigid version of Islam. Now, many claim this was in response to Christian Europe, but I feel this is sometimes a little bit too simplistic. This may be true in India, but the Arabian tribes had no real contact with the Europeans beforehand. So, I generally tend to find that many place Europeans as the cause of many movements, but really, it probably came from within. Think of this Islamic revival in comparison to the Puritans of Europe. The printing press had been introduced to many areas, finally spreading ideas across the Islamic world. And, just like in Europe, many people began to reject folk traditions, superstitions and the likes. While, as for the Persians becoming more aggressively anti-Sunni, this could be because they were just at war with Sunni nations as well. Again, this is very similar to what happened in Europe just a couple of decades earlier. However, their anti-Sunni policies were far from popular, especially among the Sunni Afghans. They united under Mirwaiyas Hotak and rebelled, rather than convert. Central to their rebellion was strangely the Georgian king of Kartli, George XI. He had sworn allegiance to the Pope back when the Ottomans failed in Vienna, hoping to exploit the situation. Then he even tried to align with the Ottomans against his Persian rulers. 
He was then arrested and the situation in his native Georgia was growing worse. So, peace was made. He agreed to convert and then was sent to Afghanistan to subdue the Afghans, but was promptly killed. So, here we see a Turkic dynasty sending a Georgian convert to subdue Sunni Afghans on behalf of Persia. You can see how this web is often a complicated mess. But the Afghans continued to win early battles and then took the capital of Isfahan in 1722. Yet, how this band of Afghan rebels, completely outnumbered, were able to achieve such victories is open for debate. In the Battle of Gulnabad, the Afghans hooked around the Persian lines and struck at their cannons. A couple thousand Persians were killed, but still they retreated, despite outnumbering the Afghans two to one. What gave them such low morale is hard to explain. Plus, the fact they sent in their cannons without escort, despite receiving European training, also just seems like poor leadership. Otherwise, many nobles and their Georgian vassals just refused to help out. So, the Safavid rulers fled, and now Afghans ruled in the capital city. During this chaos, the Russians and Ottomans took over some land from the Persians, and the new Afghan Hotak dynasty didn't last for long. In the north, Tarmas II, a deposed Safavid ruler, tried to find support to reclaim the throne. The Qajar tribe rallied behind him, and so too did Nadia Shah. Nadia was himself a Kizilbash, but he grew up very poor. In fact, in some stories it says that he, along with his mother, were enslaved by the Uzbeks. Yet he returned to Persia, and in the army he flourished. So when the Afghans invaded, he gained some degree of power in the northeast. He led the loyalists into battle to reclaim land on behalf of the Safavids. But over time it became clear that Tarmas would not be the greatest ruler. He in fact launched a disastrous campaign to reclaim the Caucasus from the Ottomans. So Nadia Shah deposed him in favour of his young son, and continued to launch more successful campaigns, reclaiming lands from the Ottomans and Russia, and finally chasing the Afghans out of the capital and back to their base. In 1736, he was powerful enough to oust and murder the remaining Safavid rulers and take power himself. But he was from a completely different tribe, the Afshar. They were again Turkmen, so again not Persian. And originally they were from Central Asia but moved to Azerbaijan before some of them moved over to Eastern Persia. Plus, most of his army were not Persian either. In 1743, he had around 375,000 soldiers. 70,000 were Afghan, 60,000 were Turkmen, and 60,000 were from Azerbaijan. Add in various other groups like the Kurdish, and you had a very diverse army, most of which were not local. This army was also remarkably well equipped, at least compared to his predecessors. The Safavids did have a corps of musketeers and artillerymen back in the 16th century, but over time the bulk of their army consisted of semi-nomadic tribal warriors. These were equipped with again whatever they brought to the field, including lances and bows. They still made up a huge chunk of Nadia Shah's forces, but they were slowly being equipped with modern 18th century firearms. And they were also drilled in the European way. This huge force, however, would prove to be too costly in the long run, and without loot, the country would have been quickly bankrupt. Nevertheless, all of this helped him actually turn the tide on the Ottomans as he invaded Mesopotamia. He also reasserted Persian control over in places like Bahrain and Oman. His greatest accomplishment though probably came in 1739, when he led an army into the weakening Mughal Empire and sacked Delhi. Even though Sikhs raided his caravans on return trips, he was still able to steal so much wealth from the Mughals that he stopped taxation for three years. Nadir Shah was now somewhat poised to become a great conqueror, emulating his heroes like Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. In fact, he even copied Tamerlane by building towers out of the skulls of his enemies and rebels. Plus, to help in this pursuit, he even tried to bridge the gap between Sunnis and Shias. To do this, he created a new school of Sunni thought, known as the Jafari school. This, after all, would gain support among many of the Sunnis in his empire, like the Kurds, Pashtuns, Turkmens, and more. And he would also gain more legitimacy abroad, in countries that he wanted to expand into. However, his cruelty worried many of his nobles, who betrayed him in 1747 and murdered him in his tent. Adil Shah, his son, succeeded him, and he had many of his relatives killed, but other relatives fought for the throne, and as they did, the country once again fell into anarchy, 
as various ethnic groups, tribes and the likes fought for power. A pretty small tribe known as the Zand exploited the situation best. They are a tribe of Lax, which in turn could be a branch of the Kurds, or as they argue, a branch of the Lur people. As you can see, many of these tribal histories are often conflicting. They originally lived in modern-day Iraq, but successive governments constantly moved tribes from region to region, whether that's the Zand further east, or the Turkic Kizilbash to Georgia, or even the Georgians out to modern-day Iraq. Population transfers seemingly occurred pretty regularly. Well, the Zand under Karim Khan Zand did follow Nadia Shah until his assassination, but they quickly began to challenge his successors. First though, they moved back to their tribal homeland in the west and settled some tribal conflicts, fighting against the Bakhtiari. This initially resulted in disaster, and the Bakhtiari leader Ali Mardin Khan seized the city of Golpa Yagan. Ali Mardin and the Bakhtiari tribe then tried to seize the city of Isfahan. Strangely enough though, Karim Khan and the Zand decided to put aside their differences and join him. They actually planned on bringing back the Safavid dynasty, at least in name, and brought a deposed young prince along with them to make the puppet ruler. So the citizens of Isfahan surrendered in 1750. Ali Mardan of the Bakhtiari and Karim Khan of the Zand were now sharing power in the capital city. But Karim soon departed to launch an expedition in Kurdistan. While he was away, Ali Mardan tried to assert his control over the capital, but Karim soon returned and the two met in battle. This following war, as you'd expect, was a complicated mess. Ali Mardan would flee to Ottoman Baghdad. There he would gain the support of an Afshar and diplomat and even a Safavid prince. Plus, he even got support from a Pashtun ruler, Azad Khan Afghan. There were plans for the two sides to divide the country to make peace and allow a Safavid prince to rule, but peace never lasted. In the end, Ali Mardan would be killed and Karim would become the new ruler of Persia. However, it was a broken country. Take, for instance, the Pashtun ruler, Azad Khan Afghan. You may think he held power near Afghanistan, but no, he held power around Azerbaijan. Nearby him were a number of Kurdish states. Now, some of their history goes back centuries, and they were largely allowed to keep their autonomy under Persian rule. Others, however, popped up very recently. Over in the east of the country, strangely, many Arabs who had settled there took power in places like Mishmasht. Turkmen tribal confederations took the north, plus for a little while, Nadia Shah's son, Sharuk, ruled in Khorasan, and in between all those states were a host of other, even smaller states. Another tribe of Turkmen came to prominence as well, the Qajar. Under Muhammad Hassan, they tried to take Mashhad from the successor of Nadia Shah, Adal Shah. He was later captured again and sent as a prisoner to live with Karim Khan. While he was in prison, his tribe continued gaining ground in the north of the country, and they would later exploit future civil wars. Possibly the greatest empire to emerge from all of this division, though, was the Durrani Empire, created in Afghanistan. The Hotak dynasty beforehand was formed by members of the Giliji Pashtun tribe, but they had already been defeated by Nadia Shah, so now the Abdali or Durrani tribe of Pashtuns would form their own empire. They had originally rebelled against Nadia Shah, but soon they were quite loyal allies of his. Nadia Shah had actually expelled many of the Gilijis from their territories east of Kandahar and settled Persians, Kizilbash, and the Duranis there. In return, Ahmad Shah Durrani served in Nadia Shah's armies, and he was apparently one of his best soldiers in the capture of Delhi. When Nadia Shah was killed, the leaders of the Durrani were outraged. They rushed to Nadia's tent to confirm the news and found his dead body. But when leaving, they did take with them the Koh-i-Noor diamond, which Nadia Shah had stolen from the Mughals. The outraged leaders also decided to appoint Ahmad Shah as their new leader of the Durrani Empire. His ethnically diverse armies quickly captured nearby lands, like Herat in 1750, Balk and Barakshan the following year, and Kashmir the year after. In 1754, he also invaded Khorasan, taking the lands from the weakening rule of the final Afsharid ruler. Meanwhile, over in the capital, Karim Khan Zand had been busy consolidating power himself, but he died in 1779, and, as is usually the case, none of his successors were able to continue to rule effectively. 
Mohammed Hassan, the eunuch member of the Qajar tribe, managed to escape his imprisonment and return to the north. There he led the Turkic tribesmen in battle, conquering much of the north and even the kingdoms of Georgia, re-establishing Persian control in the Caucasus. The Russians had actually taken advantage of the chaos in Persia by expanding into the Caucasus, promising to aid the Georgian Christians in times of war. Their king, Heraclius II, had actually served with Nadia Shah, but now the united Georgian kingdoms were happy to accept Russian protection. However, it didn't help much. Aga Muhammad Hassan was a remarkably violent leader, even when compared to many of his contemporaries. He completely devastated Tbilisi. Reports indicate the city was reduced to ashes, the roads were filled with corpses, and many of the dead were piled high into towers. Catherine the Great did send an army to retake the country in 1796, but she died and her successor, Paul I, called the soldiers back. Aga Muhammad continued to plunder and torch his way around the country, like he marched on Khorasan, captured Sharuk, and tortured him to death. The final Zand ruler, Lop Ali Khan, was then betrayed by the ruler of Bam. He was handed over to the Qajar and again tortured to death. So Aga Muhammad was able to finally be crowned Shah in 1796. However, just one year later, he launched an invasion of Karabakh in the Caucasus. There, he was assassinated by a servant who he had actually ordered to be killed. But when the execution was delayed, the servant decided to kill the Shah. His successor though, Fat Ali Shah, was actually able to succeed to the throne somewhat peacefully. There was a small rebellion led by Nadia Mirza, the great-grandson of Nadia Shah and ruler of Khorasan. However, this was crushed, he was blinded, he had his tongue cut off and ultimately was executed. So the empire was finally stable, but really this was the limits of it. To the east they helped the emir of Kalat break free from Durrani, but the Persians never exerted influence over the state themselves. While to the north, the Russians began to take their land away from them. After decades of war, the state had essentially fell far behind. Around half of their population was nomadic, they barely cultivated the land, bandits roamed around the few roads that actually did exist, and the nobility were essentially ruling independent nations. Taxes were barely paid to the central government, leaving them pretty much bankrupt and unable to introduce any new reforms. So they weren't able to modernize their army, before the Russians launched a series of wars against them in the 19th century. But you may have noticed that during the 18th century, the Persians and Afghans had invaded the Mughal Empire many times. And although I won't be focusing too much on the Indian subcontinent, I should mention a little bit about the final gunpowder empire. In the late 1600s, they were ruled by Aurangzeb. He is possibly one of the most complicated characters in history, and his legacy is still hotly debated today. He inherited an empire which again was created by Islamic Turkic rulers over a century earlier. Initially, they were ruled by tolerant rulers like Akbar, and this was particularly important in an empire mainly consisting of Hindus. But Aurangzeb was far less tolerant. He introduced the jizya, a tax on non-Muslims, and crushed rebellions brutally. In particular, in the north, the relatively new Sikh religion was targeted with particular ferocity. For instance, he executed the Sikh Guru Tegh Bahadur for refusing to convert, and this resulted in the militarization of the Sikh community. You can see this militarization of their community by the way many Sikhs still dress today, as they carry weapons to protect themselves against further persecution. Later on, the ninth Guru was also executed, while his companions were boiled alive, burned, and sawn into pieces. Bounties were also placed on the heads of Sikhs, so groups of Mughals would go headhunting, chasing them further into the mountains and forests. Again, the Mughals also largely relied on a series of alliances with different tribes, lords, and ethnicities to maintain power. And, as always, this was a delicate balance, disrupted under Aurangzeb's rule. Most notably, in the south, the Hindu Maratha rebelled against them, starting an incredibly long war. On the other hand, though, Aurangzeb had expanded the empire and turned it into the richest country in the world. But to accomplish his final conquest of the Deccan Sultanates, it would take him over 20 years and untold wealth. These Deccan Sultanates were, as the name suggests, Islamic. But once again, a complicated mix of ethnicities. Many were Turkic, or like the rulers of Bijapur, they were descendants from, once again, Georgian slaves. In Ahmadnagar, they had a number of African slaves as well, 
Some, like Malik Ambar, would even rise to the position of Prime Minister, and his daughter even went on to marry a Circassian warrior, and he would join the Mughal army. The languages spoken could be Urdu or Persian, or sometimes even local Marathi, and often the various factions within court fought one another for control. But although Aurangzeb temporarily managed to conquer these territories, when he died in the early 1700s, his successors couldn't keep control of such a vast empire. During the following succession crises, a couple of brothers, the Sayyids, rose to prominence. They almost acted as kingmakers for a while, but their origins are somewhat odd for the empire. They were from a tribe known as the Sadat Ibarra, who claimed descent from Ali. They were therefore Shia, but famously were some of the most ferocious warriors in the Sunni Mughal armies. In their pursuit to maintain power though, they constantly removed, killed, or imprisoned emperors. Like in 1719, there were four emperors. Muhammad Shah was able to finally remove them, but he could not recover the power of the Mughal Empire. During his rule, the Maratha took over most of the Deccan, while a collection of other states declared their independence. It was also at this time that Nadir Shah sacked Delhi and plundered its wealth, and of course later on, the Afghan Durranis would invade as well. For a while in the late 18th century, there was a constant back and forth between these empires. For instance, the Durrani invaded Delhi, the Maratha drove the Durrani out of Delhi, and in return for aiding them, the Mughal Empire actually became a vassal of the Maratha. Plus, during this time, the Sikhs began to take over land for themselves, and many of the newly independent states began to fall under British influence. The new state of Karnatik fell under British influence after a succession crisis and three Karnatik wars. These wars involved the French and their Indian allies against the British and their Indian allies. Then Bengal fell to the British in the 1750s. But to give you some idea of how chaotic this period was and how ruinous the wars were, this state of Bengal had been invaded by the Maratha six times in just 10 years before the British even got there. The war with the British began when the ruler of Bengal threw British traders into a dungeon known as the Black Hole of Calcutta. The East India Company should have had no chance in the following wars. After all, they only had a few hundred soldiers and a couple thousand Indian allies. But there was a conspiracy at court. Mir Jafar, the commander of Bengal's armies, defected bringing with him around 45,000 men at the Battle of Plassey. In return, he was made ruler of Bengal temporarily, but he would be removed by the British later on, and this province would now be the base of British expansion. So, just like in Carnatic, the British didn't necessarily conquer outright, but rather they supported a local leader. In the case of Carnatic, it was Walaja, who aided the British in their wars against the French in Mysore. With their Indian allies, the East India Company continued to expand into Maratha, Mysore, and Mughal territory. So by the early 1800s, after winning the Second Maratha War, the Mughal Empire was made a protectorate of the East India Company. So the Mughals had disappeared as a force by this point, although their emperor did still sit on a throne in Delhi. The Persians had seen a number of dynasties, civil wars, and a breakdown of order, and the Ottomans are losing land in Europe in particular. By the late 17th century, the powerful Islamic gunpowder empires were on the decline. Yet, in the middle of them all is the Arabian Peninsula, and there a new power was on the rise. It began in 1744 with the signing of the Daraya Agreement. This was a pact between the relatively weak House of Saud and a new theologian, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, the founder of Wahhabism. He spent much of his early life meeting theologians in the holy cities, some of whom travelled there from across the Islamic world. One of his teachers, for instance, was from modern-day Pakistan. Al-Wahhab then made his way to Basra, continuing his studies before arriving back in his homeland, with an incredibly strict branch of Sunni Islam. This is a Salafist ideology which advocates returning the Islamic world back to the days of the Prophet as best they can. In the rest of the Islamic world, many Muslims had begun worshipping things like shrines of important people, and this, in the eyes of the Wahhabis, was essentially a form of polytheism. So this hardline approach to Islam was completely at odds with a great number of Muslims at the time. The Ottoman Empire was famously, in the eyes of Westerners, a very liberal place. Harems, pleasure houses, and even homosexuality was somewhat acceptable. Endanulu Fazil, for instance, would write poems about homosexual love, and many hammams, or Turkish bathhouses, still remain a place for homosexuals to meet. 
Pedestry was also pretty commonplace in the ranks of the Janissaries, the enslaved soldiers that formed the basis of their army. There was also a practice known as Kochek, where beardless men, i.e. youths, would perform for older men. This is somewhat similar to Bachabazi in Afghanistan. The Ottoman sultans also collected holy relics from across their empire and built tombs to religious figures. Like in the Eyup Sultan Mosque, you can still see the tomb of Muhammad's standard bearer. Al-Wahhab set about destroying all of this. He set up his first base in Uyena. There he convinced the leader to destroy a tomb dedicated to a companion of the Prophet, stone adulterous women, and cut down sacred trees. However, nearby was the Bani Khalid tribe, ruling over Al Hasa and Katif. They pressured the leader to expel Al Wahhab, who found a new home in Duraya, a small town outside Riyadh. There, Muhammad bin Saud al Mukrin had taken power back in 1727, and he was keen to expand his lands. So he provided a haven for Al Wahhab's followers. With these new migrants, a force was created, and they planned on taking over all of Arabia. Riyadh, however, took a long time to fall, but by the late 1700s, they were on the advance. However, Arabia by that time in history was weak. Although it was home to the Islamic holy cities and one saw camel caravans trading up and down the peninsula, almost as soon as the Islamic caliphates were created, they shifted their capitals north. Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, and more recently, Constantinople, were all centers of learning and power while Arabia was generally just home to pilgrims and warring tribes. On these tribes, let's start with the Bani Khalid, the group that expelled al Wahhab initially. They ruled in the east around Qatar. This region was once dominated by the Portuguese who had forts around the Persian Gulf, but they were chased out. And once the Portuguese were gone, Ottoman interest in that area waned as well. Plus, with the Shia Safavid dynasty on their doorstep, the Ottomans closed the pilgrimage route from Persia in an attempt to stop any further conversions. However, this angered many locals who lost a great deal of money, so they joined the migrating Bani Khalid, and they created their own independent emirate in 1670. Under their rule, Shia influence continued to grow, including in Bahrain. Here again, the Portuguese had a base, but rebellions drove them from the island in 1602. In the ensuing chaos, Shah Abbas I of Persia was able to move in and take over. Theologians were then dispatched to Bahrain, and Shia Islam flourished. So, even today, they make up at least half or potentially more of the population, but there are some disagreements over these numbers. However, in the early 18th century, the Safavids were on the decline, so Oman decided to take advantage of this and invade Bahrain. They would sell it back to Persia, but they were now too weak to hold on to it. A group of Iranian Arabs known as the Huwala then sailed across the Gulf to take it for themselves. But then Nadia Shah invaded, Karim Khan did as well, and no one could really hold on to the island. Most of the villages by this point had been burned to the ground, and many of the pearl divers, who once made a great deal of money for the island, fled to nearby areas. By the 1780s, the island was being ruled by Nasser al Madka. He was a Huwala that, in theory, was part of the Persian Empire, but really he was an independent ruler. Then, in 1782, a dispute arose with the Bani Utba tribe. They seemed to have emerged in that region around a century earlier, and were involved in a number of wars. Sometimes they helped the Persians, and sometimes they helped Oman. Eventually, they found a base in modern-day Qatar, especially in Zubara. One tribe within their confederation was the Al Khalifas, who migrated from Kuwait. Well, they began buying supplies in Bahrain, but they were fired upon, starting a war. The Persians sent troops to Bahrain to aid their allies, but the Khalifas won and took the island for themselves, and they continue to rule over the island until today. Another branch of the Bani Utba had actually settled in Kuwait, which had been under the control of the Bani Khalid Emirate. This was just a small fishing village created in the early 1600s, and the Bani Khalid actually seized it from the Ottomans, but they still granted the Bani Utba permission to live there in 1713. This tribe had been raiding nearby lands and travelers, so this was a move welcomed by the Ottomans as well. Yet, when they arrived, the families appointed Sabah I bin Jaba as their ruler. He would rule as the first sheikh of Kuwait, under the rule of the Bani Khalid initially, but in 1752, it was agreed that they would be allowed to break free if they would remain out of all future wars and not meddle in the affairs of the Bani Khalid. This new Kuwaiti state would later become home to refugees fleeing the Ottoman-Persian wars. They brought their skills to the city, and soon they began to challenge Basra for dominance in trade in the region. So much so, 
that the English East India Company relocated their base there in 1792. Going back down south though from modern day Qatar to the UAE, this region was pretty sparsely populated. Some European powers did try to gain some sort of footing in the region, albeit just through trade. Like the Dutch in the early 1700s, tried to take over the trade of pearls. However, the strange thing is, nobody really knows who held onto power at that time. But what we do know is soon the Kawasim and the Bani Yas did grow in power. The Kawasim were more prevalent around Sharjah and were dominant on the seas, while the Bani Yas living in Abu Dhabi and Dubai were pastoral people. Both of these groups would form close ties to the Wahhabis. However, the Kawasim would later draw the British into a war through their piracy in the Persian Gulf. Historical records of where these groups came from are therefore pretty scarce. Abu Dhabi itself was probably only settled in the 1760s, with people migrating there from the Liwa oasis further inland. There seems to be some mention of them on a 16th century Ottoman map, but otherwise very little record of them. Yet, today, these two groups form the basis of the ruling elites of the Emirates. Moving further along the coast we come to Oman, possibly one of the more stable elements in the Arabian Peninsula. They were ruled by the Yarubids, who had been a force in the country ever since the 9th century. But they were neither Sunni nor Shia, they were Ibadis. Their country, like others, were dominated by the Portuguese for a while, but in 1624, the people united behind Nasir bin Murshid to chase the Portuguese out. They eventually succeeded and even went one step further. They built up a huge navy and began to chase the Portuguese out of their other colonies, including Mombasa, Zanzibar and Gujarat in India. This happened towards the end of the 1600s, so shortly before they attempted to take over Bahrain. These colonies provided Oman with a great deal of wealth and thousands of slaves. Zanzibar in particular became a slave hub, filled with plantations. And to fill up these plantations, the slavers would launch raids deep into Africa, as far west as the Congo. In fact, some of the slavers in later history like Tipu Tip would set up their own slave states. However, Oman too would have to deal with a number of succession crises. Like in 1718 to 28, the throne would swap hands about six times. An uneasy peace was agreed upon, with different tribes forming alliances with the different claimants. Much of the interior of the country supported Balarab bin Himyar, while the coastal region supported Saif bin Sultan II. Saif tried breaking the deadlock by inviting Nadia Shah to invade the country in 1737. Nadia Shah obliged. He invaded, looted and enslaved his way into the interior before departing again. But even though his rival was defeated, Saif had other challenges pop up, like Sultan bin Murshid in 1742. Once again, the Persians were called in to help, this time in exchange for land around Sohar. The Persians besieged the city and even moved into Muscat. Saif died during this invasion though, leaving behind no heir. So his dynasty ended and the people elected Ahmad bin Said al-Busaidi to be the new Imam of Oman. He came from one of the two major tribal confederations of the country, the Hinawi. They live primarily in the southeast of the country, while their longtime enemies, the Kafiris, live in the northwest. Ahmad bin Said had actually come to prominence during his defense of Sohar for over nine months. But now in power, he had to try to reclaim land from the Persians. And luckily for him, it was around this time that Nadia Shah was executed. But now in power, he had to try and reclaim lands from the Persians. But luckily for him, it was around this time that Nadia Shah was assassinated. The Persian forces were thrown into chaos and this is when he invited them for a feast at his fort. There, at this feast though, he proceeded to massacre them. Some parts of his country still remained loyal to the Yoruba, but he largely consolidated his power, and the Busayid dynasty was created. They however refused to take the religious title of Imam, and moved their capital to Muscat from Rustak. They also continued to expand their navy, so much so that only Britain had more ships in the region. This dynasty, by the way, still rules over Oman today. On land they expanded west, taking over Tumrayat and Salala. Salala in particular used to be particularly important in previous centuries, as it was the centre of the frankincense trade. But by this point, the city and much of the province of Dofar had largely become depopulated. On the borders of Dofar, there were some pretty small states like Mara and Katiri that date back to medieval times. To refer to these as sultanates or anything like that, 
seems to be somewhat of an overstretch, as they were largely just tribal confederations, but historians continue to do so. Moving west from there, there was a collection of small stakes like La Hedge. These were all part of modern-day Yemen, which is one of the oldest civilizations of Arabia. But the numerous medieval dynasties that once ruled over Yemen had collapsed, they'd been attacked by the Mamluks and Portuguese, and fought a number of civil wars. The country was therefore completely divided, and in the early 1500s, an Ottoman governor reported, Yemen is a land with no lord, an empty province. Obviously this wasn't exactly true, but it justified their invasion of the country. This put the Ottomans in control of various roads into the holy cities, and gave them control over the incense and coffee trade. Yemen, at this point, was the only country that actually made coffee. But the Ottomans could never subdue the Zaidi tribesmen in the north. This group of Shia decided to rise up in the late 1500s in response to the Ottoman attempts to spread Sunni beliefs. Al-Mansur al-Qasim was appointed the first Imam, and he began the fight against the Ottomans. This fight was continued by his son, Al-Muayyad Muhammad. This fight against the Ottomans dragged on for years, until in 1634, they seized Mocha. This city was far more powerful than other cities like Aden or Sana at that time, and thus it was made the new capital. However, the new Zaidi state of Yemen went even further. They at one point tried to capture Mecca and Medina, but were driven back. So they just spent the following years consolidating their power over the neighboring tribes. They also began trading with the Mughals, Safavids, Ethiopians and more. But as a religious state, they decided to expel all the Jewish people from within their country. This, however, was more of a massacre, as the Jews were sent out into the desert to perish. These Jewish groups had lived in Yemen since ancient times, and they had come to dominate trade in many of their cities. So after one year with their economy tanking, the Yemeni rulers realized their mistake and invited the Jews back. Once again, though, succession proved to be disastrous. In the early 1700s, various civil wars began to fracture the state, and many broke free. And, as the country began to disintegrate, they would also have to deal with the Sunni Wahhabis. Moving north of there, we've got some tribes that I've mentioned before. The Banu Hashim tribe had helped the Ottomans during their invasion of the Mamluks, so they were granted the title of Sharif of Mecca. And there's the Shamar further north, who migrated as far away as northern Iraq from time to time. But in between these two lay a whole host of nomadic tribes. The Zoran in Al-Bahar province, the Otaiba in the center, Bali in the far north, the Asiya on the borders of Yemen, the Ruwala stretching into the Syrian desert, and the Anisa nearby. There were of course dozens more, who would often migrate, displace other tribes, and generally engage in tribal wars. Some of them were happy to live under Ottoman rule, collecting money from pilgrims passing by. Others were bandits, robbing those who passed by. Others lived far off in the desert, far away from any central powers. But all of them quickly had to make a decision on whether or not to fight or join the new Wahhabi power. This Wahhabi state, once Riyadh fell, quickly began to gain followers. Most of Najd agreed to follow them as they launched attacks on the Bani Khalid, turning them into a vassal state. Nearby tribes like the Bani Yas also agreed to support the House of Saud, placing the modern-day emirates under their control. In each of these places, they slaughtered many destroyed tombs and shrines, and in Taif in particular, enslaved thousands. Rulers in Oman tried to fight back, but they too were promptly defeated. To the north, many of the local rulers of the Ottoman Empire were worried about this new threat almost immediately. Like Suleiman Pasha, the ruler of Baghdad, the Sultan ordered him to invade Wahhabi territory a couple times, and he did manage to lay siege to Daraya. But his troops suffered in the deserts, and when Wahhabi reinforcements arrived, they retreated back home in humiliation. Then in 1803, after Taif fell, the leaders of Mecca declared their allegiance to the Wahhabis, where, once again, all sorts of holy sites were destroyed. From Mecca, they went on to take Medina, and they also struck at the Zaydis in Yemen. Possibly the most destructive action came in Iraq, though, when the Wahhabis stormed into the city of Karbala, one of the main holy cities of Shia Islam. There, they sacked the mosque of Hussein ibn Ali, a grandson of the Prophet. Some of their soldiers traveled even further north into Syria, and there they demanded that the governor of Damascus accept Wahhabism. All of this destruction caused panic across the Islamic world, and was a source of humiliation for the Ottomans. For starters, the Persian Shah criticized them for being unable to deal with this new threat, and Shias just about everywhere 
were generally horrified by their massacre at Karbala, so much so that a Shia Muslim assassinated Abd al-Aziz, the new ruler of the Wahhabi state, during his morning prayers. But still, the Sultan had to make a deal with the Wahhabis, in order to secure safe passage for pilgrims travelling to the holy cities of Mecca and Medina. This was because many pilgrims were actually rejected from entering these cities because they were now seen as non-Muslims. This rapid expansion of the Wahhabi state could, in some regards, almost be compared to the initial rise of Islam, inasmuch as they were finally able to unite the Bedouins and were able to effectively use their military skills. Obviously, this is in comparison to them just fighting each other constantly. But more than that, this alliance between Al-Wahhab and Bin Saud created a somewhat unique bureaucracy and government for the region. New Islamic judges were appointed in every new town they conquered, and these religious leaders were given upwards of 20% of looted wealth. This helped spread the new doctrine, but also created a very strict financial system, well compared to the other Arabian tribes. Vast amounts of wealth was looted and accounted for. This obviously helped equip the growing army, but also encourage more tribes to join their empire voluntarily. After all, it was a choice of joining their advance and sharing their wealth, or face their populations being massacred should they hold out. And, of course, it should be said that there was probably just more of a market for these ideas in Arabia than elsewhere. Take, for instance, the face veil. The Quran does tell women to dress modestly, but what that is, is open for debate. But the face veil, or the burqa, was an Arabic tradition that goes back to ancient times, long before the dawn of Islam. So in Arabia and nearby regions, many women would just cover their face regardless of religion. For instance, like in Egypt, Coptic Christian women did as well. Female infanticide was also prevalent in the days before Islam as well, with their preferred method of killing being burying the kids alive. Compare all of this to the Turkic people. Women there, like among the Mongols, could hold quite important positions, especially in the Seljuk Empire. Obviously, this isn't an exact rule, but it could explain why Wahhabism gained such a strong following in Arabia compared to elsewhere. But remember, some women in Turkey did wear a face veil, and some sultans did target things like the drinking of alcohol. Plus, many Arabian tribes fought against the Wahhabis, and they used to practice many things not in line with their ideology. Russian historian Alexei Vasiliev even claims that before Mecca was abandoned in 1803, you could find alcohol sold near the Kaaba, and prostitutes were accepted to the point that they paid taxes to the rulers of the city. Plus, the Wahhabis even banned playing music, something that many pilgrims used to do on their approach to the city. So how the Wahhabis gained such a strong following in Arabia so quickly is open for debate. It should be said, though, that some joined their ranks for political reasons. Like the leaders of Bahrain wanted protection from Oman, and in Oman, one claimant to the throne wanted help in actually claiming the throne. And as for the Ottomans, they were probably just more worried about a threat to their power, humiliating them by destroying religious sites they were supposed to protect, and, maybe, another Islamic ruler calling themselves Caliph. In fact, the Europeans reported that Selim received a message from Saud, saying, I entered Mecca, I kept peace towards the inhabitants, I destroyed all things that were idolatrously worshipped. So, a new force had emerged, ready to challenge the Ottoman Empire for dominance. But it's probably important to continue looking around the world that they're expanding into. Right the way over in the far west, there's Morocco. Here, Ahmad al-Mansur in the late 1500s invaded Mali and was poised to turn the country into a great power once again. However, plague struck the region, Al-Mansur died, and the country fell into civil war. In the midst of these wars, the Alawis rose to power. According to their history, they were descendants of Muhammad through his grandson Hassan, and they were invited to Morocco in the 13th century. When the ruling Sardian dynasty battled against the Europeans over their colonies in Morocco, the Alawis seemed to have presented themselves as holy warriors, with religious legitimacy. They then used this power to take control of Tafalalt on the Algerian borders. By the middle of the 17th century though, Morocco was still in anarchy, as Arabs and Berbers fought one another for control. One faction was the Delaya Sultanate, a group of Sufi Berbers. They advanced on the capital city and ended the Sardian dynasty, but they in turn were ousted by the Alawis, the holy warriors, under al-Rashid, and the Alawi dynasty was born. Under their rule, they recaptured cities like Tangier from the English, 
and Ashila and Madia from the Spanish. They also began to trade extensively with the Europeans, while at the same time sponsoring pirates to raid their ships. However, succession was once again always a problem. Ishmael ibn Sharif, the second ruler of the dynasty, fought against his own nephew for control of the country. Then he had a harem of 500 women and at least 800 children. So there was another 30 more years of anarchy as brother fought against brother. Ishmael, by the way, had tried to modernize the country and bring local Arabs into his army through the Gwich system. This was supposed to break tribal loyalties by requiring each tribe to send men to join his new army. Land was promised to the soldiers and military positions became hereditary, creating a caste of tribal warriors. But the country was left in a state of almost permanent mobilization. And in this period of instability, each mobilized tribe within the system threw their support behind a different claimant. Retribution was also swift and bloody for those who picked the wrong side. Given all of the tribal differences, many rulers had relied on the Black Guard, slave soldiers from sub-Saharan Africa. They belonged to no tribe, so were seen as more trustworthy. But they too fought for different claimants to the throne during this period. As a quick point of comparison, this was around the same time that the Seven Years' War was being fought in Europe, and nations like Prussia were rapidly centralizing their nation and their army in particular, while in Morocco, tribal conflicts and succession wars were the order of the day. During this time, just as an example, Abdallah of Morocco was Sultan from 1729 to 34, then again in 36, then from 40 to 41, and again from 41 to 42, 43 to 47, and finally from 48 to 57. It wasn't until Muhammad III came to the throne that the situation settled somewhat. He had to move the capital city to Tangier to avoid the Black Guard and reduce their power. Yet they continued to rebel and proclaim new sultans. Plus the country was hit by an earthquake, destroying Casablanca, and then struck by famine and plague in the 1770s. This crippled their farming output, so the country was forced to import most of their goods. Nevertheless, they did achieve some victories. Like in 1765, the French arrived in Larache. They intended to wipe out the Barbary pirates, which had taken advantage of the Seven Years' War, and brought a lot of European trade to a standstill. But the Moroccans were able to drive the French back. Then the Portuguese retreated from Mazagan. Yet even with British assistance and 40,000 men, they still failed to take Melilla from the Spanish in 1775. As you can see, Mohammed III had set up diplomatic links across Europe, just like his predecessors. But he went even further, as he was one of the first countries to recognize the independence of America. But he died in 1790, and once again, the country was thrown into chaos. His son Yazid ruled the country for two years and brought back the Black God to power in order to persecute the Jews in Tetuan. And he also had to deal with rebellions from his half-brother, who also claimed the title of Sultan. The country was brought back to some sort of stability when Suleiman bin Muhammad became Sultan. However, his rule marked the beginning of a shift towards Wahhabism and isolation. Across the border from Morocco lay the Barbary states of Algiers, Tunis and Tripolitania. This whole region had once been home to a number of states. Some of these stretched across huge chunks of North Africa. Empires like the Moroccan Almohads and the Zarids managed to conquer a great deal in medieval times. However, historically, there seems to be some precedent behind the borders that the Ottoman Empire gave them. For instance, the Hamadids in the 11th century and the Kingdom of Tlemkin in the 16th century sort of formed their countries around the borders of Algeria. Nearby, the Tunisians had long been ruled by the Hafshids. Modern-day Libya, however, doesn't follow this trend. Their state was split between Tripolitania and Cyrenaica, and before the Ottomans invaded, they were sort of under the influence of either the Mamluks or the Hafshids. Even their capital city of Tripoli was held by the Knights of St. John of Malta prior to the Ottoman invasion. These three territories and Morocco were historical bases for piracy, even going back to medieval times. It was so bad that the Christians set up a holy order known as the Trinitarians to pay ransoms and even take the place of would-be Christian slaves. This order, by the way, was established way back in the 12th century. There was even the Barbary Crusade in 1390 against them. Then, after the Christians retook Spain, thousands of Muslims and Jews from Iberia began to join their ranks, like Sinan Reyes. Captured Christians and the occasional adventurer 
would also join them as well, like the Italian Occhiali, who was captured as a boy and forced to convert, or Jan Jan Soon, a Dutchman who joined the pirates in their Republic of Sala. These pirates enslaved potentially over 1 million Christians during their history, raiding as far north as England, Ireland and even Iceland. Some of these raids could be devastating, like in 1551, they enslaved the entire population of the island of Gozo in Malta. Many of these people would become galley slaves, forced to work on the ships that would go on to capture even more slaves. Those that wanted to pass through the seas peacefully would have to pay the pirates an annual tribute. This is something nearly every fearful European nation did. In this environment, the rulers were able to act more or less independently, funding their states through raids or by getting tribute. Generally speaking, each captain would give around 10% of ransoms or whatever they plundered to the governor of the state. These governors were usually referred to as a day or a bay. So, confrontations in this area usually revolved around who had most power, the day or the Ottoman sent governor, the Pasha. The Pasha, to try and assert his authority, did have the help of the slave soldiers, the Janissaries, but often this wasn't enough. Like there was the case of Ali Bitchin in the 1600s. He was a former Christian slave who led his ships against the Venetians in the 1630s. Most were destroyed in storms before the Sultan just went ahead and made peace. The Sultan also never paid him for the lost ships, so he refused to participate in future wars. But then he was poisoned in revenge. To make matters worse, the pirates continued to attack indiscriminately, regardless of whether or not the Sultan was trying to mend relations with other countries. For instance, the French built the Bastion de France near Nava, looking to cash in on the coral trade. Around the same time, the Ottomans had signed an alliance with the French, but the base was attacked in the early 1600s and so too were French ships. Then in the 1650s, the waters around Marseille were filled with pirates and the island of Corsica was raided. The Sultan, meanwhile, could do nothing to stop them. In the 17th century especially, various European countries began to attack the pirates and their bases. They would usually demand an everlasting peace and free passage through the seas. Like in 1675, the English bombarded Tripoli. The Europeans also had some colonies in the region, like the Spanish-owned Oran and Mers el Kabir since the early 1500s. The Algerians managed to retake them in 1708, while the Spanish War of Succession was ongoing, but the Spanish retook them both in 1732. Yet, looking at each state in a little more detail, let's start with Algiers. The militia there, way back in the 1600s, petitioned the Sultan to allow them to elect their own ruler, or day, to hold a position equal to the Pasha, or governor. They continued to strike at the Europeans though, sometimes resulting in retaliatory campaigns. Like in 1683, the French bombarded Algiers to free slaves. The days in the late 17th century included the likes of Mesomorta Hussein, who came from Mallorca, and after him was Hajj Chabani. He was quite willing to make peace at sea, as he had aspirations on land, and he went to war against the Moroccans in 1691. While over in Tunisia, they were also having just as many problems. Since the early 1600s, the Mouradid dynasty was tasked with governing the region for the Ottomans. Their founder though was actually a Corsican slave, showing again most of the influential people in the region weren't actually native. This dynasty didn't last long though, as in 1675, Murad II died and the revolutions of Tunis began. Decades of rulers being killed by their opponents. Ibrahim Sharif with Ottoman backing wiped out the dynasty, but his rule didn't last long either. As he was captured by the Algerians, so one of his subordinates took power. Tripoli followed a similar pattern. After being ruled by the Ottoman Janissaries and Pashas for a few decades, there was a rebellion in 1611. This raised a local pirate to the rank of day. Decades of coups, counter coups and the likes followed. And like in the other states, the day was still dependent on the Sultan to send fresh recruits of Janissaries to the region. These Janissaries would collect taxes while the pirates raided foreign ships. Some of the most notable days, which also claimed the title of Pasha, were Mehmed and Osman Sikizli, and after a few attempts, 
they were able to bring all of Cyrenaica under their rule. So there was a complicated and often brutal system in place in the 1600s. However, at the turn of the 18th century, a war between the states threw the period into chaos and brought about great changes. Hajj Chabani, as mentioned before, brought about peace at sea and marched on Morocco. He demanded that they pay tribute before he marched on Tunis, with a pretender to the Tunisian throne. After all, this was the same time as the revolutions of Tunis, so many pretenders were happy for their help. Chabani was initially successful, but the following wars epitomize how disastrous the nation's politics could be. The Moroccans and Tunisians formed an alliance, even though Algeria and Tunisia were both allegedly under Ottoman rule. To compare this, imagine if Scotland and France formed an alliance to fight against Wales. The Sultan did try to call for peace, but he was just ignored. Then even Tripoli joined Tunis in their attack on eastern Algeria, while Morocco assaulted the west. Armies of up to 50,000 looted their way across the region, while all countries faced internal rebellions and factionalism as part of this, the Maghrebi War. Nobody was really able to make a breakthrough though, and every country saw a change in government. The eventual failures of Algeria and these wars led to the day being killed, and then a period of chaos until 1710. During this time, some days were killed hours or days after being elected. Baba Ali Chayush became the ruler in 1710, and he refused to accept the Pasha sent by the Sultan. Algeria then essentially became independent, with an elected monarchy of days, who all declared war and negotiated peace, all without consideration of Constantinople. The Janissaries still remained though, and the day continued to fight them throughout the 1700s. Sometimes the Janissaries were successful in killing the day, but eventually another day would just win back control. Then, to complicate matters even more, there were the Odjaks. These were supposed to be part of the Janissaries, but were incredibly autonomous. They acted as sort of the guards of the day, and in later history would become kingmakers. Some notable rulers at this time were Baba Ibrahim, who was elected in 1732 after having served as treasurer. He was the one that lost Oran back to the Spanish, but he was able to fight off a Spanish attack on Algiers itself. Plus he achieved victory in a war against Tunis, turning them into a vassal temporarily, by, once again, marching into the country with a pretender king. At sea he began to see that many Europeans were refusing to pay tribute for safe passage, so he declared war on Denmark and demanded tribute from countries like Britain and Sicily, while in Tunis they broke free from the Algerians. But going over to Tunis and back in time a little bit to the early 1700s. There, a Janissary named Ibrahim Sharif had been sent to Constantinople to recruit or buy more Janissaries. But once he was in the capital, he received orders from the Sultan to kill the ruler of Tunis and take power for himself. He obliged and ended the Muradid dynasty in 1702. However, once he was in power, he was quickly captured by the Dey of Algeria. So his subordinate, Al Hussein I ibn Ali, was invited to rule Tunis by the Ottomans. With the backing of a lot of Janissaries and even Mamluks, he asserted his control over the region and created the Husaynid dynasty, which ruled Tunisia until the 20th century. It would be this dynasty that would fight against Algeria and have to pay tribute to them. This dynasty continued to raid European ships and face punitive attacks. Like when Hamuda ibn Ali was ruler, the Venetians decided to bombard Tunis. For two years, from 1784 to 86, the Venetians bombarded Tunisian towns, but the Tunisians didn't come to the negotiating table. The Venetians realized a land invasion was essential, but the Venetian Senate refused to agree to this, so they just retreated instead. As for Hamada, he ruled from 1782 all the way up until 1814, so Tunis had become pretty peaceful when compared to its neighbors. While over in Tripoli, a Janissary named Ahmed Karamanli murdered the Ottoman governor and took power for himself. In 1711, the Ottomans were forced into accepting him and his new Karamanli dynasty as being the new rulers of the region, after he fought off a couple of attacks. However, one of his successors, Ali ibn Mehmed, refused to take control of the daily affairs of the state. This was crucial, as there was no real infrastructure in place to govern the land. All of the revenue, expeditions and the likes depended on the direct rule of the bey, or at least his subordinates. Therefore, by the 1780s, the country began to fall into chaos. His two sons began building up armies ready for war on his death, and on top of that, just like elsewhere, 
there were more tribal conflicts. Like the Al Nasir clan rebelled from their base in Fazan. Civil war eventually broke out, brother murdered brother, and then an Ottoman officer entered the country in 1793. His name was Ali Pasha, and like most other influential characters in the region, he was a foreigner. He was actually a former Georgian slave that had served in Algeria. He arrived in Tripoli with mercenaries from Spain and Greece while claiming to be serving on behalf of the Sultan, although this is disputed. He actually won and chased the Karamanlis out of the country. The Karamanlis fled to Tunis where they got support and invaded the country again, ending the Tripolitanian civil war. There were further fights between brothers though, like Hamid Karamanli ruled in 1795 before being ousted by his brother Yusuf, and Yusuf would later have to face the Americans in the Barbary Wars. Barbary Wars. They had lost control over much of North Africa during the 18th century, and even their control over Egypt was volatile at the best of times. Who held power here was again incredibly complicated. The Sultan had to contend with the Mamluks, who, like the Janissaries and many pirates, were originally slaves. In fact, these Mamluks had fought off Mongol invasions, crusaders, and even ruled the country until the Ottomans invaded. They were then left in positions of power in the government, usually in control of finances, holding the title of Bey. Plus, they could continue to recruit slaves into their ranks, so the Ottomans had their Janissary slave soldiers there, alongside the Mamluk slave soldiers, both of which largely came from areas like Georgia and Circassia, but both were opposed to one another. The Ottomans then also sent many pashas to rule there, but some, like Hein Ahmed Pasha, tried to assert some independence in the 1500s. He was, again from Georgia, and declared himself for a short time to be the Sultan of Egypt. Constant changes in Ottoman pashas allowed the Mamluks to begin to assert their authority, and mutinies became commonplace. For instance, in 1610, the Ottomans had to send Kara Mehmed Pasha to Cairo to crush a Mamluk rebellion and restore some sort of control. But really, most in the administration and military were Mamluk slaves. And to make matters worse, these Mamluks even began to form factions, like the Fakari and Kasimi. However, there's no clear definition as to why these two groups were divided. One 18th century chronicler wrote, The people of Egypt from ancient times were in two factions, soldiers and Bedouins and peasants, white flag and red flag until the administration of the House of Osman, when they became Fakari and Kasimi. But later origin myths say that they were divided by origins, northern and southern Arabs. Yet the Kasimis seem to have taken their name from Kasim Bey, a man who recaptured Mecca from the Yemenis in 1631. It seems that his faction was supported by many from the east, like Uzbeks and even Bedouin tribesmen, while many slaves from the Balkans and Anatolia made up the bulk of the Fakari faction so it could also be an east and west split. This complicated factionalism sometimes led to violence, as they both sought control over certain provinces. This means there were splits between Janissaries and Mamluks, and Mamluks and Mamluks, and that's just the foreign slaves. As for the locals, they did rebel sometimes. Like in 1711, a fanatic preacher began to denounce praying at the tombs of Sufi saints. This began a three-year religious uprising in the country, but really, the foreigners, like elsewhere, held the real power. Then, these Mamluk factions went to war with one another. The Janissary sided with the Kasimi as they crushed the Fakari. But then, new factions emerged. The Kazduglia, for instance, sprang up, and they, in the 1730s, would make their push for power. They succeeded and Ibrahim Ketkuda took over. He appointed Ali Bey al-Kabir, another man from the Caucasus, to be as number two. Ali, the second in command, was actually given the title of commander of the pilgrimage, and it was his job to safely transport pilgrims to Mecca, showing that it was far from safe to travel across this empire. In this job, though, Ali began to launch raids against Bedouin tribes in the desert, and he began to grow in power himself. But when Ibrahim died, he didn't come to power right away. There was assassination after assassination, until finally, in 1760, he was able to take over. He quickly set about trying to extend his power by exiling Janissary officers and recruiting even more Mamluks. The Ottomans tried to stop him by inviting rival Mamluks to kill him, and they even laid siege to him in his palace. So Ali Bey ran to Gaza, where he met Zahir al Umar. Keep this guy in mind for later on. Ali then returned to Cairo, quickly eliminated his rivals, and he even stopped sending tribute to Istanbul. The Ottomans asked him to send troops to help fight against the Russians, 
but Ali just took the opportunity to declare himself the new sultan of an independent Egypt. He even began to advance into Ottoman lands. Like in 1770, he occupied Hejaz and appointed his cousin to be the new Sharif of Mecca. Then he moved as far north as Syria, linking up again with Zahir al-Umar and actually the Russians. The Russians, while at war with the Turks, equipped Greek rebels and sent them to take over Beirut. However, put a pin in this for now, as this involved all sorts of rebels from the Levant. Ali Bey would eventually be betrayed by Abu al-Dabab, who turned his troops against his former ally on behalf of the Ottomans. Ali Bey was then killed in the ensuing fighting, and al-Dabab was killed shortly afterwards. Al-Dabab was succeeded by two of his own allies, Murad Bey and Ibrahim Bey, who would rule up until Napoleon invaded. Again though, these men both came from the Caucasus. But going back to those rebels in the Levant, the Ottomans he had largely kept the same administration as the Mamluks had. The region was divided into provinces like the Damascus Eilat, and then subdivided into Sanjaks like Safad, Jerusalem and Gaza. But most of this region was entirely rural, as most cities only really had a few thousand people living in them. Plus, this land was filled with different religions and ethnicities. The Ottomans allowed most of them, or at least the recognized groups like the Jews, Armenians and the likes, to follow their own laws and live in autonomous communities. This was the millet system, which could be seen as a pretty liberal approach to governance. However, it meant many groups remained isolated from the sense of a larger nation. Take, for instance, the Greeks. They could continue to speak Greek, pray at Orthodox churches and the likes. So when people describe the Ottomans or even the Austrians, they often say that they were multi-ethnic empires and therefore doomed to fail. However, being a multi-ethnic empire or not can very well be a choice. Compare this to the Russians, for instance. They conquered people of all different religions, like in Islamic Kazan, and they ruled over people who spoke a variety of languages. But the Russification of their conquered lands began in the 1500s. In some regions, religious buildings were destroyed, Russian was made the mandatory official language, and ethnic Russians were forcibly settled. Even in smaller countries, which we wouldn't call empires, they followed a similar playbook. France has long been made up of conquered peoples with their own language, the Flemish, Basque, Bretons, Corsicans, and the likes. But through a series of repressive laws, their languages were suppressed. Some of these laws were pretty recent as well, like German was outlawed in Alsace-Lorraine in 1918, and in 1925, the Minister of Public Education said, for the linguistic unity of France, the Breton language must disappear. And it's this sort of thing that turns a would-be multi-ethnic empire doomed to failure into a historic nation with a proud united people. However, that's not to say the Ottomans never actually attempted it. I'll come on to one example later on. But for the most part, they either couldn't or didn't succeed in bringing together their people. Yet a more immediate problem for the Ottomans was another, probably essential, but probably disastrous policy, tax farming. To grossly oversimplify this, the Sultan would auction off the right to collect taxes in a certain region or on a certain product. This was a nice and easy way for the Sultan to make money, and it broke down the empire into manageable chunks. In theory, these people would send a chunk of those taxes back to Constantinople, but a lot would obviously be kept for themselves. Wealthy families could win a bid, impose their own taxes, recruit their own armies, and act like a state within a state. So when we look at the provinces, they would collect their own taxes and have their own armies, while in the countryside, different tribes and clans and ethnicities would collect their own taxes and have their own armies. The main provinces, though, that we'll discuss include Damascus and Aleppo, which of course make up Syria today. But also, at this time, they would include Israel and Palestine as well. These used to be great cities in medieval times, but they had begun to decline. Silk and luxury goods that once flowed from the east stopped arriving once the Safavid dynasty collapsed. European merchants who had been there for a couple of centuries began to leave, and these once powerful cities became weak. To make matters even worse, they were struck by all sorts of disasters in the 18th century. This would actually be the case for much of the region. Constantinople would be hit by an earthquake in 1756, and a series of fires in 1718, 1750, 1756, 1782, and 1785. Sometimes these destroyed tens of thousands of houses and killed tens of thousands more. 
There would also be plague epidemics which hit other major cities, like in 1719 in Cairo and Constantinople. They would be hit again in 1770 and 1786, and in the capital, it's estimated maybe two-thirds of the population were lost. Other important cities like Izmir were constantly bombarded by epidemics, while Baghdad lost maybe two-thirds of their population in an epidemic in 1773. But probably Aleppo suffered even more. Besides the pandemics and the likes, they were also raided by Bedouins nearly constantly. The villages surrounding the city were destroyed, stopping food and production and causing a famine, which by 1798 had wiped out half of the population. Sieges also caused disastrous famines in cities like Baghdad in 1733. Misrule and wars caused famines elsewhere like in Egypt and Tunis in 1784, which forced thousands to flee as refugees. Locust caused a famine in Diyarbakir in 1757, so maybe all of the problems discussed could be linked to these disasters, either natural or man-made. As for the rulers here though, they constantly changed in Aleppo and Damascus, and even in the smaller regions as well. To give one example to show how power could be claimed, there was the Ridwan dynasty in Gaza. Ahmed Pasha in the early 1600s began to make a great deal of money ruling this small territory. He then used his wealth to bribe officials in Constantinople and was then awarded control of all of Damascus. This dynasty though only really ruled in the cities. Like in Aleppo, the hinterland was dominated by Bedouin families like Abu Rish and Al Abbas. They were appointed as desert emirs by the Ottomans, so they ruled over tribal confederations independently of Aleppo, which in turn acted independently of the Sultan. And again, you can repeat this across the entire region, almost like a Russian doll of power. Next to Damascus and Aleppo, there was Tripoli and Sidon. But even though they were smaller, even within their lands, there were further divisions, notably the Emirate of Mount Lebanon. This emirate was divided between Druze, Christians, and some Muslims, and it was created back when the Ottomans first invaded the Levant. In this emirate, there were a few leaders to rise up, like Fakir al-Din II. He was born in the late 16th century in Lebanon, which was filled with feuding factions, usually based on religion, Druze and Christian and the likes. Fakir was himself a Druze, but soon he would unite everybody. His territory was under the control of Tripoli and the Ottoman Pasha Yusuf Sefer. Yusuf was probably a Turkmen or Kurdish, it's unclear, but he was pretty tyrannical. So many of the locals, including Christians, joined Fakir in a war for dominance against him until they won in 1607. Fakir was recognized as the ruler by the Ottomans, but he felt his position was not secure. He looked for allies abroad and strangely found one in Tuscany. He received military support from the Tuscans, but in return, he was supposed to help out in a future crusade that the Grand Duke of Tuscany was planning. The Ottomans were of course worried about this, so he was sent into exile. But he soon returned, formed an alliance with his old rival Yusuf Sefer, and together they began conquering. He took over Lebanon, parts of Syria and Palestine, ruling over a state until the 1630s. Although he was finally defeated, many of the Christians and Druze that once fought against each other remained united and he is considered the father of Lebanon today. There were other provinces like Zor, which was sometimes considered part of Aleppo, sometimes its own entity. However, it was largely desert and filled with Bedouins. So we'll just stick with these main ones. Well, it was in the Damascus islet, around modern-day Palestine, that Zahir al-Umar was born into a Bedouin tribe. This was the Zaydan, that just a couple of generations earlier had settled down and been appointed tax farmers around Sidon and Galilee. They had actually been appointed by the rulers of Lebanon, who I'll get onto soon. Zahir was then appointed to negotiate peace with the Zakia Bedouins, a tribe that raided camel caravans and plundered villages. But Zahir made an alliance with them instead and moved into the city of Tiberias in the 1730s. From here, he built up his position, treating locals fairly, including Christians, and helping them with local repressive rulers. So he was able to expand down along the coast seizing control of the cotton trade in the region. And a lot of this was done peacefully and through family connections or even just friendships. Meanwhile though, over in Damascus, another man was beginning to grow in power, Ishmael Pasha al-Azim. His al-Azim family had come to power in the 1720s when the people led by religious leaders rebelled against the corrupt and heavy-handed Pasha, Circus Osman. 
Their origins, however, are a little obscure, as some say they were Arab Bedouins, while others say they were Turkish. Well, just like Zahir, they wanted to assert their control over more of their territory. So they got the backing of the Sultan and attacked Zahir. Zahir managed to drive them back though in 1738, despite being betrayed by the Zakir tribe, and then a period of peace followed. During this peace in Syria, the Alazim ruler would attack Druze communities and accumulate vast amounts of wealth. So the Ottomans replaced them in 1757, but his successor had to deal with a huge problem. That same year, the Zakir tribe attacked a pilgrim caravan, killing thousands, including the Sultan's sister. Now, the cause of this is to do with, like elsewhere, authority and local rivalries. This tribe had long been the largest in northern Hejaz, and were given the right to protect the pilgrims. This, however, also meant that they could launch smaller raids, steal and sell goods to pilgrims on the way. So, it was a very lucrative role, as well as a prestigious one. But they were soon joined by the Anisa, who moved from Iraq and Syria. And the Ottomans angered the Zakia by giving the Anisa the right to protect the caravans. However, it's not always that simple, as both tribes launched joint raids in 1700 and 1703. But the Cimmerian anger grew worse when a drought hit the region that year, and they slaughtered thousands returning home to Syria. The Ottomans actually blamed the Alazim family for orchestrating the attack in revenge, so they had their leader executed. Zahir was also accused, but he decided to purchase goods from the tribe, including the royal banners, and handed them over to the Sultan almost as a peace offering. Zahir, by this point, was actually working with French merchants, building up quite a modern arsenal, and in 1757, he expanded again into towns like Haifa. There were, of course, rebellions as per usual. Zahir had to deal with rebellions from his own children, who were often backed by the rulers of Damascus. There was also all sorts of complicated political intrigue, once again, like some in the Alazim family, had survived and they now ruled in Sidon, but now they sided with Zahir as they hoped to take back Damascus from Uthman Pasha. And Uthman was only given control of Damascus because, as a Mamluk in the service of the Alazim family, he knew where they kept their wealth, and he directed the Ottoman authorities to it. But Uthman was able to move first, and he helped have his own son appointed as the ruler of Sidon. Again, remember, all of these people are supposed to be part of the same country, and, as of yet, the central government has done very little to stop all of these wars. In fact, it was probably too late for the Ottomans. Zahir was now too powerful, and they were forced to acknowledge his authority. So, he was granted the title of Sheikh of Akka, Emir of Nazareth, etc. But still, Zahir hoped to move on Damascus. So, he formed an alliance with Ali Bey of Egypt, and together they marched on. They had to attack tribes like the Banu Nuaim to move into Syria and once at Jaffa, there they met the Russians. Although Ali Bey later left the war, Zahir continued with the support of these Russians. He actually even got support from the Druze and the Shia tribes of Jabal Amil. Together they then took Beirut, but once again, wild stories of betrayal changed history. This time it centered on a Bosnian called al Jazar. He had served in the army of Ali Bey, but then fell out over the assassinations of one of his friends. So, he fled to Syria and joined the ranks of the Damascus forces. He was then tasked with defending Beirut, but decided to change sides and join Zahir. But he then joined the Ottomans, forcing the Russians to return and oust him once more. However, by 1774, Russia made peace with the Ottomans, and Zahir was forced to fight against his enemies alone. He was eventually surrounded and killed. All sides during this conflict requested assistance from the Shahab dynasty, which ruled in Mount Lebanon. Before them, the Man family were awarded control over the region in return for loyalty during the wars with the Mamluks. But when their final ruler had no heir, he nominated the Shahab to come to power afterwards. This, however, was a controversial pick, as they were Druze. Again, this region was split between Druze, Christians, and Muslims. So, to maintain power, they formed an alliance of sorts with the Maronite Christians. But their position was never very stable. Like in 1711, they had to defeat their rivals at the Battle of Ain Dara. The rulers of Damascus would also launch punitive expeditions against them for failing to pay their taxes to the central government. So, in the late 18th century, the Emir, hoping to get some sort of protection, 
converted to Christianity. He even began to enter talks with the British, allowing Protestant missionaries into his lands. Yusuf al-Shahab was the ruler when the Mamluks invaded Syria. But once the war was over, al-Jazar believed Yusuf was plotting against him, so he moved his forces into Lebanon in the 1780s and forced him to abdicate. Bashir Shahab II took control afterwards, and he will be one of the most influential rulers in Lebanon's history. During his rule, which lasted until the 1840s, he destroyed the power of the Feudian clans and largely centralized control. However, he will soon be swept up in further chaos in the area, like when the Egyptians once again invaded. In the middle of Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt, there was Jerusalem. When the Ottomans took over this region in 1517, it was estimated that around 5,000 Jews still lived in the city and the surrounding lands. But they were soon joined by some more, fleeing from persecution in Spain, like Jacob Barab. He had big plans to bring back some ancient practices, focusing on creating a council of sorts to govern over Jews around the world. However, the authorities, including the chief rabbi and the sultan, were worried that this was the beginning of a plan to bring back the Jewish state. So, he was exiled. Many Jewish people continued arriving though, yet their base was Safed, not Jerusalem. Here, they settled in different quarters based on their origin, which could be as far away as Hungary, Yemen, or Livorno. By the end of the 1600s, they probably numbered around 30,000 in this town, and they experienced a bit of a boom. For instance, they used the printing press long before the Muslims in Constantinople did. While over in Jerusalem, the Sephardic Jews began constructing synagogues. Some continued to try to push for the creation of a Jewish state, like Joseph Nazi from Portugal. He had tried to pressure the Ottomans to conquer Cyprus and create a Jewish colony there. Then he began requesting that Safed be turned into a Jewish city-state. Obviously, this was all rejected, and there were many problems that this group faced. Some Jewish people were sent to Cyprus to improve the island's economy. Then, in the middle of the 1600s, they were trapped in the middle of a war between the Ottomans and the Druze. During this war, Saped was pillaged, and many of its inhabitants were massacred by the Druze. It is also around this time that a man named Shabbatai Zevi claimed that he was the new messiah. Many European Jews were swept up by his message, and it's important to say why. In the 1640s in Ukraine, Bogdan Kemelnitsky and his Cossacks launched a brutal campaign against the Jews killing up to 300,000. Those that survived were once again living in exile, and in their desperation, they were obviously welcoming of news of their Messiah. Those that believed he was the Messiah were called the Shabbateans, and many of them began making plans to travel to the Holy Land in the year 1666. Here you can see that they were probably influenced by Protestant beliefs at that time, as many believed that the world was coming to an end. For instance, in England, one group known as the Fifth Monarchists rose up in London in the year 1666 and declared that Jesus would be their prince. So, many Jewish thinkers, like Manasseh ben Israel, also began to believe that the world was ending. He was also convinced that some of the South American tribes were lost tribes of Israel, and the unification of these tribes would be instrumental in the end of the world. He also wrote to Oliver Cromwell saying, We both believe that the restoring time of our nation into their native country is very near at hand. In the end, though, the would-be messiah was arrested in Constantinople in 1666, and, rather than be executed, he agreed to convert to Islam. In response to all of this, more inwardly-looking branches of Judaism emerged, like Hasidic Judaism in Eastern Europe. Nevertheless, more groups of migrants continued to arrive in Palestine. Like in 1700, Judah Her Hasid brought hundreds of Ashkenazi families to Jerusalem. This new group, though, failed to pay loans they took out to build a synagogue. So, the synagogue was set ablaze, and all Ashkenazi were expelled from the city. Chaim ibn Attar led Moroccan and Italian Jews to the Holy Land in 1742. Then, more Hasidic Jews from Lithuania arrived in 1777. European Jews continued to arrive in batches from here on out, especially after Vilna Goen rose to prominence in Lithuania. He could be called an early Zionist, as he advocated for a return to Jerusalem and many of his disciples, known as the Perishim, would begin arriving in the early 19th century. However, the number of Jews, Muslims, and Christians in Jerusalem during this period is disputed, and all of that land at the beginning of the 1700s was being ruled over by Mehmed Pasha Kurd Bayram. He was a harsh leader, 
leading punitive campaigns against the raiding Bedouin. But also, which was not all that uncommon, he brought the prisoners and spoils of war back to the city. He also put the heads of hundreds of people on the city walls. The Naqib al-Ashraf revolt broke out in 1703, uniting all sorts of different groups and removing the governor from Jerusalem. The Ottomans sent in troops to crush the rebellion, but there was a bit of a power vacuum left behind. The Ottomans therefore needed to find a new Naqib al-Ashraf. This title was given to those designated as the head, almost, of the Prophet's descendants, and usually given to a clan leader. So the reason the rebellion was called this was because the former Naqib al-Ashraf had led it, but he had been killed. So the Ottomans appointed the al-Husseini family to become the new heads. This family would soon become a dominant force and would lead Palestine into the early 20th century. For instance, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Amin al-Husseini, would lead the Palestinians in revolt against the British and seek to form an alliance with the Axis powers. But going back to the Jewish people, they also made up a sizable chunk of the population of Baghdad as well. But modern-day Iraq was largely divided between Mosul and Baghdad. Well, there was also Basra in the south, but that often fell under the rulers of Baghdad. The whole region had completely fallen from its once glorious past after being sacked by numerous invaders, like the Mongols, Timurids, the Persians, and in the 1500s, the Ottomans. The Persians would take it back temporarily in the 1600s and then again a century later, meaning that Mesopotamia had largely become a battleground. Mosul, therefore, was essentially a fortress, guarding the route into Anatolia. This city, so far away from the capital, and in a war zone, was possibly one of the most autonomous regions in the empire. But the rulers had to govern over a complicated collection of ethnicities and religions, like the Yazidis, Assyrians, Kurds, and more. Many of these were also free to govern themselves, so they had autonomy within a region that had autonomy. Starting with the Christian Assyrians, they had divided in two, with one group joining the Catholic Church again in 1552. As they were split and not altogether too numerous, they were often grouped together officially with other ethnic groups like the Armenians. But they were left alone, around their mountain bases like al Kosh. The Yazidis and Kurds, on the other hand, had their own hereditary emirates or kingdoms. The most dominant of these was the Baban clan, which were actually given their own province of Sharazor. Their history before the Ottoman conquests is pretty vague. It seems that they were just given control over this border region and tasked with defending the empire from the Persians. This suited them pretty well though, as their main rivals were fellow Kurds, the Ardalan, who were part of the Persian Empire. However, all of this territory was divided into these small states. These were relatively small, often focused around a main town or a couple of villages. They often fought one another over the centuries, trying to gain further lands, and these wars often spread across the borders. Again though, the origin of these states are somewhat disputed. But just to give one example, Bitlis was created in medieval times by the Rojaki Tribal Confederation. They emerged as an independent state after the fall of the Akkoyunlu Confederation. They then agreed to join the Ottomans in return for being granted their autonomy. It is said that this emirate could call upon 12,000 men to defend themselves at their height, but in the 18th century they were on the decline due to succession wars and the likes. Not all of these emirates were Kurdish, as some were Yazidi-led, and they all surrounded the Ottoman province of Mosul. Here, in the early 18th century, the Jalili family came to rule over the city. They were originally Christians that managed to make a great deal of money as merchants. They used their wealth to take over the Janissary corn in the city and acquire allies among the urban elites. So by the early 1700s, they had essentially taken control over the region and converted to Sunni Islam. Under their rule, Mosul saw a huge boom in construction of baths, markets, and importantly schools. But because Mosul became a center of learning, this just encouraged further migration into the city. Notably, many Kurds from the countryside moved there and brought with them their Sufi traditions. Plus, the Persians were also converting many locals to the Shia faith, add that to the number of Assyrian Christians there, and they were joined by Dominican priests that Pope Benedict XIV sent in 1750 so it was a bit of a patchwork like elsewhere. Yet, they did succeed in maintaining the peace somewhat, and in 1743, they were able to raise an army and drive back the Persians. This was a great advance for the Ottomans. As had the city fell, Nadia Shah of Persia could have advanced onto the Levanta Anatolia. However, as a provincial force fought in this war, it showed just how little power the Ottomans had 
in the furthest reaches of their empire. Despite all of this, the Jalili rulers like Amin Pasa would be removed from power and reinstated numerous times, as the capital tried to reassert their authority. But they then quickly realized that they needed the family to rule over the city, so they brought them back. Plus, the governors did help out the Ottomans in foreign wars, serving in the Russo-Turkish War of 1768, so they would continue to rule until the early 19th century when the Ottomans finally tried to centralize their rule. As for Baghdad, the Ottomans had captured the city from the Persians in the 1500s, but in the 1630s, the Persians tried to reclaim the city. The Ottomans were able to take it back, however, it was essentially a border town, also far away from the central control of the Sultan. So, they sent Mamluks to rule over the city, crack down on the Arab and Kurdish tribes, and bolster their defenses. Hassan Pasha, again another Georgian, arrived in Baghdad in 1704, and, with his fellow Georgian troops, managed to create a dynasty. They did become effective tax collectors, and again helped drive back the Persians. But like with elsewhere, there was more politics at play. The Ottomans, worried about their power, tried to send replacement rulers to the region. Yet, the Mamluks under Suleiman Abu Layla Pasha were able to march on the city from Basra and restore control. Suleiman then took power in 1749, but he had to face a brand new threat, the arrival of new Arab tribes. The al muntafiq had long worked with the Ottomans, as they accepted their authority in the 1500s. However, they had been driven from their homeland around al Asa by the Banu Khalid. They were also joined by the Shamar, who migrated as far north as Mosul. They weren't the only tribal confederations in Iraq, though, as there were much older tribes like the Zubayid, who came shortly after the Muslim conquests, and the Dulaim, who were actually pre-Islamic, or the Bani Lam, who arrived in the 14th century. Obviously, there were many others, but historically, the distinction between these groups was not always particularly clear as they often fused together or split apart. But what's notable about the Muntafiq and the Shamar in southern Iraq, and even the Banu Tamim, is that they converted to Shia Islam. There's some mystery as to when exactly they did, and their motives. But it seems that when the Safavid dynasty in Persia collapsed, many Shia Muslims fled to Iraq, and there they met the migrating Arab tribes and converted them. Shia holy cities like Najaf and Karbala were almost in ruins at the beginning of the 18th century, but they quickly became centers of learning and pilgrimage for the new converts. These cities, however, would quickly be under threat from the growing Wahhabi powers in Arabia, who would actually attack them in the 1800s, thus causing further divides between the Sunnis and Shia in the region. Other divides would be made when the Ottomans tried to modernize the country and limit the power of the tribes. Many leaders would become ardent Shia Muslims as a political move, to fight back against the Sunni rulers in Constantinople. And I should add, most of the Marsh Arabs are 12 as Shias, however their history is incredibly obscure. There's very little evidence as to where they came from, let alone why and when they converted. Suleiman, the Mamluk ruler of Baghdad, therefore had to fight against this new threat. He managed to take back Basra from the al muntafiq and turned it into a bit of a base of international trade by inviting the British East India Company there. The al muntafiq meanwhile, founded their own city, Nasiriya, after being chased into the countryside. The Mamluk rulers also had to continue fighting against the Persians, who, under Karim Khan, had invaded Basra in 1776. Plus, the Ottomans, desperate to assert their control, continued to remove the Mamluks from power. The Mamluks were always able to retake the city, and to further strengthen their control, they brought in thousands of fellow Georgians into the region thus allowing them to rule well into the 19th century. These Mamluk rulers of Baghdad would also be ordered to attack the Wahhabis in the south, where they failed. And again, the Wahhabis would strike Iraqi lands afterwards, massacring the people of Karbala. Yet, with all of this chaos going on, there was one province where the Ottomans were actually able to assert some degree of authority, Raqqa. There, they actually had plans from very early on to turn it into a Turkish state of sorts. This was, after all, closer to Turkish Anatolia, and the capital of this province was Urfa, which is today in Turkey. The region had also been left depopulated thanks to many invasions, notably by Tamerlane, so much so that in the 1600s, it was reported that the city of Raqqa had been abandoned, and Bedouins lived in tents outside. So, from very early on, they were subject to the government's housing policy. 
This was mainly implemented in areas closer to the capital, where it was more based on ethnicity. But out here, going back to the 1500s, Turkmen and Kurdish tribes were moved from Anatolia into Raqqa. Their main focus here was actually bringing nomadic tribes into the cities, or even just to have them stop moving about. One of the largest of these tribes was the Kurdish Milan. The Ottomans, to bring them into the fold, gave them the title Head of Sedentarization, hoping they would settle down and in turn encourage others to. The province was therefore somewhat peaceful in comparison to the many others. But this was probably the only one in the Middle East. And thanks again to Enlisted for sponsoring this video. All of you history buffs out there, sign in at the link below and collect your free rewards, and I'll see you out there on the battlefield.